Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Royal Economy and Connectivity Committee's eighth meeting in 2019. Could I ask you please to all ensure that your mobile phones are on silent? No apologies have been received, and we're going to move straight on to agenda item one, which is the restricted roads 20 mile an hour speed limit bill, Scotland. This uh, con con is the committee's third and f will be th the committee's third and fourth evidence session on the restricted roads 20 mile an hour speed limit bill. The first committee will be taking evidence from Police Scotland, local authorities, an academic and the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland. Following this, the, the committee will be taking evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure, Connectivity and the Scottish Government officials. So on the first panel, I'd like to welcome Walter Scott, the Vice Chair of the Liaison Committee, and Kevin Hamilton, member of the Society's Traffic and Road Safety Working Group um, and the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland. I'd also like to welcome Chief Superintendent Stuart Carl, the Divisional Commander, Road Policing Division, Operational and Specialist Support, Police Scotland. Uh, Dr Ruth Jepson, the Reader in Public Health and Principal Investigator on Research into the Impact of 20 mile an hour speed limits in Edinburgh for University of Edinburgh. Adam Andrew Eason, the Road Safety and Active Travel Manager of the City of Edinburgh Council, and Brian Young, the Infrastructure Manager for the Scottish Borders <coughs> Council. Now, you are probably all been at the committee before, <coughs> or given evidence, or I don't know if you have, um, to, to the Parliament. So let, let's go through some of the rules to try and make it easy. You, you don't need to touch anything on your panel in front of you. That will all be operated by the gentleman on your left. So what you have to do is if you want to speak in answer to a question, you have to catch my eye and I'll bring you in. Once you've caught my eye, the secret is then not to look away and just keep talking because then I'll have to interrupt you if you go on for too long. What I'll tend to try and do is I've, I think you're... You've made your point and you may be labouring your point. I'll try and waggle my pen at you, which gives you a good indication that I'll be looking for, for, for you to wind up and so we can bring somebody else in. As there are a lot of you on the panel, it's going to be difficult for all of you to answer every question. So <clears throat> don't be offended if I don't bring you in. I will try and balance it as best I can. Um, the only other issue is if you all look away when a question is asked and giving me the clear indication you don't want to answer the question that of course is incredibly dangerous because I shall just pick one of you to answer it and that will probably be the one who looked away first so hopefully you'll all get a chance during this evidence session uh, to to answer questions there are quite a lot of questions there are a lot of you so I always appreciate short answers um, and and so we'll try and keep it moving so you all get a chance but if if you want to speak, just catch my eye and I'll bring you in. It's the secret. So the first question is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener, and short questions, no doubt, as well. Um, good morning, panel. I just would like you all to answer a very simple question. Do you agree or uh, support or oppose um, the proposals in the bill to go down to 20 miles an hour on restricted roads and just a brief reason of your answer? So... Walter, you can start and we'll work straight down the line. Sounds good, convener. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, the Scots' position on this is that we are generally supportive of the bill, um, certainly the intentions of it, um, and as with many things, the devil will be in the detail, which no doubt we will touch on today, hopefully, and as we've been working with the, uh, the bill preparation, we would hope to see some of those areas of concern, shall we say, that would be uh, picked up uh, as the bill progresses through the, the parliamentary process. Kevin. Yes, as uh, Walter said, uh, the Scots position is generally supportive of the, the bill and the aims of the bill. Um, in particular, the, I, would, I would say that the majority of uh, pedestrians and cycles, uh, cyclists um, make up the, the biggest proportion of people who are killed and seriously injured in urban areas. So there's a road safety argument. Um, but crucially, from the local authority point of view, I think that... Um, the, the, the way the bill is framed probably uh, makes the most cost-effective uh, mechanism for local authorities to be able to introduce widespread, consistent 20 mile an hour limits uh, across the whole of Scotland. Stuart. Convener, uh, Police Scotland supports any measures that will reduce uh, road casualties 
there's plenty of evidence that says lower speed limits uh, achieve that. Um, like the previous speakers, we'd like to see maybe some more of the detail, but where we can, we support existing 20 mile an hour uh, zones that are promoted by local authorities. Ruth. So I've got two answers to this. In my role as the person evaluating the 20 mile an hour in Edinburgh, I have to be unbiased, therefore I don't have any particular view on it in that role, but in my role as a public health academic, I support what we call upstream um, interventions, which is things like legislation, which can have a big impact on the health of the population. Andrew. Uh, City of Edinburgh Council, supportive of the bill. Uh, we've already implemented widespread 20 mile per hour limits, so it'll not make a lot of difference to what's happening on the ground in Edinburgh in terms of limits. It will, however, make other local authorities who want to take a, a similar approach make it a lot easier for them to do so in the future. We also think it will go a long way to building acceptance, understanding and increasing compliance with the limits, which will be important for Edinburgh going forward. Brian. Thank you. Uh, Scottish Borders Council entirely supportive of any measures that will help to support road safety. Um, we're also broadly ac acceptant of the, the intention of the bill and to make it easier for local authorities to actually introduce 20s. Um, we do, however, remain very concerned that there's a, the bill is very much a one-size-fits-all and that it disadvantages some of the rural areas. Um, we feel that the, the bill, as it currently stands, would have a significant financial impact on the council. Um, be unlikely to have any appreciable impact on accident numbers, and mainly because they're already very low in, the, in these areas, and actually only have a, a limited impact on the, the speeds. Thank you. Okay, um, I want to pick up a couple of issues. Um, Kevin Hamilton, you said that on the on the balance, it's probably the most cost-effective ways for, way for councils to do this. Is this a, a, a view that's spread across all councils, considering what we've just heard from borders? Um, I think the answer to that is no. There's not there's not a a, a unanimous view on on that amongst uh, local authorities. But um, in in my opinion, and based on the evidence that I've seen in the the financial memorandum and uh, the work that I've done looking at this for, for West Lothian Council, which is a council that I uh, work for, um, I think that it does, uh, it, it is a cheaper way of doing it in an authority that hasn't already gone down the road of widespread 20 mile an hour uh, implementation. Kevin, I, I know Walter wants to come in. Maybe you could just clarify a statement just so I understand that in there. You said uh, there wasn't a majority. Did you say that? Or, or how many how, are councils are more in favour, more against? What, what is it? I said it wasn't unanimous. Yeah. Well, it wasn't unanimous. Walter, can you clarify? Yeah, I, I can clarify. We've um, we've undertaken um, a a poll of sorts, um, not necessarily statistically fully valid from our, our membership on certain aspects of the bill and progressing it through. And there is a, uh, a bias towards being in favour of, of the bill and uh, the cost effective nature of it. Probably 50 to 60 in favour, and maybe 40 to 50 against, in terms of that, depending on the, the don't knows in that regard. Okay. Sorry, Do you find that that's a split between rural and urban? The analysis doesn't show that. I think certainly there's a, an introduction of, of um, interest from the local authorities. One of those that responded was Fife Council. One of those was City of Edinburgh Council. Uh, we're both very experienced in terms of already rolling out the, the 20 mile an hour uh, bill I th or limits. I think in that regard, there's, there's probably one of those authorities in favour, one of those less in favour. So I don't think it's as straightforward to be thinking it's rural, non-rural. Uh, although the, the, the premise has always been that it was uh, more straightforward to implement a more understandable in an urban environment than it would be in a rural environment. Um, Brian Young, could you maybe go in a little bit more in depth about what you think the difficulties as a rural um, authority that you're going to face? Yes, the, the difficulties, and it, it goes back to the financial memorandum. Um, the financial memorandum at point 40, it, it makes a point that it's... Um, 
I'll just quote from it, it's probably easier. That's why it is expected that local authorities would incur some costs under the bill relating to using the order making process to introduce a network of roads with a higher speed limit. These costs would be lower than they must currently incur to achieve a similar outcome. And on that basis, it really says there'd be no costs involved in that aspect because it's equitable. But there's a very basic assumption there, and that is that all authorities are looking to introduce 20 mile per hour widespread throughout their areas, which is not the case. Most authorities have looked at this in the past and they've made a decision and they've introduced what they were, they were intended to introduce already. So this would be very much additional work. So would you prefer to see the status quo where you are being able to choose which areas or streets or um, housing estates, schools or whatever it is to take down to 20 um, as and when you saw fit as a council? Yes, that would be our preference. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm afraid, Gail, you pushed the envelope there on questions. I'm going to have to move on to the next one, which is, which is John. Uh, John. Thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, the bill is obviously called the Restricted Roads uh, Bill, but I think my question is, you know, why restricted roads? And should it actually be a whole area that would be 20? I think my understanding is from Edinburgh that uh, you have gone for zones and that that would include maybe an A1, even the A1 could be part of a 20 uh, zone, um, whereas the bill proposes only the uh, restricted roads and if we took a village or a small town like Hoyk or somewhere, presumably the, the main road through will be will stay at 30 and the side roads would all be 20. So I wonder if it wouldn't be easier just to make the whole thing 20. So could I have any thoughts on that, Mr. Scott? Uh, yeah, the, the, the premise in terms of simplicity of approach, or even with that in terms of what is a restricted road, what's not a restricted road and how consistent that is across the, the country does, does differ slightly. Um, there has to be a boundary set on that and therefore the restricted roads themselves uh, is a, a fine principle. And then what I would say in terms of that is the, the likes of the roads that you're talking about, A roads and B roads that would be effectively running through, um, which aren't restricted roads, would not default to a 20. Uh, the, the premise there would be, and that's one of the things that Scots is looking for, is that more that time and resource to undertake more detailed assessment, that the, the powers would be available to local authorities through the TRO process to then incorporate those kind of areas into 20s if that's appropriate. And so therefore are you, are you happy that it's the TRO process or would it be just simpler to put it in the bill? It would, it would all be what I would suggest is it would be more complicated if you try to put it into the bill and therefore the, because you, what you've then got is a lot of local consideration as to whether for a, an A road or a B road which may be at a, maybe deregulated, maybe 50 or 40 or 30 in that regard, there has to be some local consideration for that and therefore to then strictly apply for all of that type of uh, environment down to a 20 I think would be overly restrictive on local authorities to actually demonstrate that local applicability of the 20 mile an hour limits. Okay, Mr. Hamilton. Um, sorry, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Can, can we bring Andrew in and then yes, come back? Just yes, to, to sorry, Andrew, sorry. could you come in there and I'll come back to you, Kevin. Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify Edinburgh's approach um, in terms of a blanket rollout to all roads only applied to the city centre. There was a cordon put around the city centre and every road within that is a 20. Out with that cordon, it was very much a judgment based on the type of street, how it functioned and the use of the street. So residential streets, streets with high levels of pedestrians and cyclists and shopping streets primarily. So you do have arterial routes that for part of their length are still 30 miles per hour and in part of their length are 20. And obviously there's a bit of route consistency to be, to be achieved there as well. Um, as my colleague said, if the bill was to go through, there is still the option for local authorities to tailor the speed limit using TROs. But what the bill would mean is instead of having to do TRO, on our road network, for instance, about 80% of our roads are now 20 miles per hour. So under current legislation, we would have to do TROs for 80% of our roads. If the bill were to go through and we wanted to retain a network of streets at 30 miles per hour, for instance, we would only have to do TROs for 10% of our road network. Uh, so in terms of the, the process, that's where the difference comes in. Kevin, did you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, just to give a little bit more information on this restricted roads issue, um, I've had a look at the, the situation in West Lothian, and most of the A and B roads, which
which run through built-up areas in West Lothian are already covered by an order under Section 82 of the Road Traffic Regulation Act, which designates them as restricted roads. So, in effect, if the bill came into to being, those roads would default to 20 miles an hour okay. anyway. Right. And I understand that position is probably similar in, in other authorities that made a restricted roads order in 1985, when the, after the Road Traffic Regulation Act was, was enacted, um, that there was, a, there was a historical situation uh, whereby in, when the Road Traffic Regulation Act was enacted, um, it wasn't clear whether uh, A, B and C class roads were going to be included within the definition of restricted roads. The regulations that, uh, that, made, the dis that made A and B roads not restricted roads came some time later and in the intervening period local authorities made restricted roads orders which um, designated many of the A and B class roads in their urban areas as restricted roads. That's very helpful, thank you. Yep. Can, I, can I bring Stuart in? I'm, I mean we're all looking, I'm, I'm certainly confused by this because this is something that we've, we've, we've never heard before. Stuart, do you want to just follow I, that? I just, it's just a technical question. Was it one roads order that covered all the redesignation of A and Bs as restricted, or did you have to do them individually? Okay, and I can only speak for the Lothian Regional Council order because that's the one I'm familiar mm, with. Mm. Um, that was one order right. that designated all the A's and B's that the, the authority at the time wanted to be restricted roads were, are all contained within one order. And since that time, Certainly in West Lothian, we have continued to vary that order when new built-up parts of A's and B's have come on, come on stream. That's it. Uh, OK, it doesn't shed any light on what other councils did. Mike, you want to come in on that? Thanks very much, Convener. Yeah, my question, um, I wonder if the members on the panel could help me out on this. I, I'm in favour of 20 mile an hour zones when we can appropriately do them. The question is, is this bill the best way of achieving that. Looking at the evidence that we've already received, if I can quote Edinburgh City Council, under the current law, Edinburgh City Council have, have done it, basically. But it's still, if this bill passes, it's going to cost them up to a million pounds to remove all the repeater signs and do everything they need to do with this legislation. That's going to cost them a million. We also heard from Highland Council, that gave us evidence, that this will cost them, as well, a great deal of money and, and basically... They give the evidence of Wick in the north of Scotland, where I asked them, you know, would it would it would this bill make their life easier, uh, work-wise, never mind cost-wise? And their response was, no, it wouldn't, because they'd have a similar amount of work to do to change the roads going through Wick. So basically, my question is this: if we're all in favour of reducing 20 mile an hour roads to the appropriate level and make the roads safer, is this bill? The best way to do it, considering that the council's evidence to us already has that's going to cost them a lot more than what's in the financial memorandum, and it's not going to save them any work. OK. Um, Brian, do you want to go on that? Yeah. Um, in some ways, certainly the intention of the bill is to make it simpler and to make mm. it easier for authorities to do, to do this, to introduce the widespread. The difficulty is that not all authorities have looked at this and decided to bring in widespread 20 mile per hour. Mm -hmm. For my own authority, what we've done and we've researched this is that we've introduced them at schools, on the routes to schools. Uh, we believe that's the place where they can be most effective, where people are most likely to understand them mm -hmm. and are most likely to comply with mm -hmm. them. Um, we don't really intend, it wouldn't be our choice to extend it further than that. Part of the reason is that we fear, like other uh, road safety initiatives, the wider you, you spread them out, mm -hmm. the, uh, the more diluted they, they can become. So actually introducing it throughout all our uh, towns and villages, we feel may actually impact on where we actually have them in place just now. Do you want, do, do, sorry, Mark, I just want to bring Peter in because then I'd like to go to Walter. I mean, it, 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 this is a bit of new evidence, I think, that we've, we haven't heard before, that the likelihood that A and B roads passing through towns and villages are, are, are potentially going to go down to 20. And I have concerns about that. People need to get about their business. Lorries need to deliver stuff and folk need to get their work. 
And I am concerned that uh, this is a, a step far too far. And I, I just wonder how uh, the police would, would, would look on this. I mean, are you, going to, are you actively going to start looking at uh, in, uh, enforcing 20 mile an hour through the middle of, on A and B roads, through the middle of towns and villages? Because if, if you aren't, I think that what we're going to do is 90% is of people are, are going to be breaking the law. And I do, that's not a position I, I think we should be putting folk in. So I would ask Stuart to, con con to, to, to comment on, on where the police are with this possibility. Okay, and, and, uh, Mr Chapman, you're going to have to apologise to Mr Finney afterwards for asking his question. But as the question's been posed, Stuart, I'm going to bring you in on that. Stuart, we, we, we'll sort it out afterwards. Stuart, if, if I may. Your convener, um, thinking back to um, what Mr Mason asked, um, if he thinks about the, his area of Glasgow, the Edinburgh Road, three-lane divided carriageway, but it's a 30, but to the to the driver that would appear to be a higher speed limit. But it's a 30 for a very good reason, due to a lot of side streets, a lot of uh, heavy traffic. But there are at certain times as you travel along that route that the speed increases. And I can think of numerous other examples, having met with Mr Rusco in Stirling, where I live, the A9 runs through Stirling. Um, there's already been a reduction from 60 down to 40 uh, for, for the main route that goes into Stirling as part of work that local authorities have undertaken. So I would have concerns that uh, the, the bill might then seek to impose that 20 mile an hour as a blanket. Um, you're asking specifically uh, police enforcement. If the law is enacted, the police will play their part in upholding the law. But 20 mile an hour zones will not be a priority because the majority of casualties are on faster speed roads. So we will continue to you know, focus finite resources on uh, those areas. Our safety camera units um, that uh, come under the programme, meantime their equipment is not calibrated um, for 20 mile an hour. So they will continue to be deployed on 30s and above. So you won't expect to see them suddenly switching into, you know, into urban areas. So yes, we will uphold whatever law is passed, but it will be done uh, proportionately. Um I'm going to bring um, John Finney in uh, because this was an area he wanted to look at. John, do you want to come yeah, in? Now? Yeah, thank you. A, a number of questions for Mr. Carroll on that. Mr. Carroll, um, good morning and thank you all for your evidence. Um, a, in a previous session, we heard from a range of speakers who, who, many with a grin in their face, said, well, it's not enforced anyway. So I, I was somewhat surprised. I appreciate the evidence from Police Scotland is probably historic rather than responsive to that. But um, I would have thought you would want the opportunity to um, stress that your obligation as, as a police service is to enforce legislation that's passed. That includes the existing 20 mile an hour drones. Yet you've now told us that camera enforcement isn't possible because it's not calibrated. Why would that be the case? It's down to the type of equipment that, that's used. So we can go through a process of having that equipment recalibrated. But meantime, the safety camera vans that you'll see out in the roads that move about the flexible sites, they're going to prominent crash locations. They're going to locations where we'll have the greatest influence in reducing speed and detecting motorists. And we detect between four and 6,000 speeding motorists across uh, the country using these measures just now. And we do uphold the law. Uh, the inspector sitting be behind me just now is the unit commander for Edinburgh City, and he works with the local policing teams in enforcing those 20 mile an hour zones, primarily with community police teams. See, th there seems to me to be a bit of a catch-22 in this, because and I, I, I note what you say about prevention and reduction in carcerages. That's, that's very, very positive. Uh, you talk about maximising the potential to do that. Then um, you, you talk about... Um, killed and seriously injured, and that's a factor that you use, and traffic offence data. But if you're not enforcing, the t or if you're not treating as a priority the 20 mile an hour um, areas, you're not going to have traffic offence data from in that area. We've already heard that it, the cameras fans don't do it. Um, so um, you, you talk about attract routes that would attract higher offending rate, but again, if you're not actively um, uh, working in the 20 mile an hour areas, that's a fact that's going to be discounted too. Now, if I may, th there's a, there's, I find it deeply offensive, but there is a, a calculation around the cost of an injury, a cost of a death. What, what would it take by way of ch child injuries, child fatalities, heaven forbid, to change the priority that would ensure that there was enforcement and more rigorous enforcement in 20, existing 20 mile an hour, never mind. What uh, I must do is um, 
operationally prioritise where I can have the biggest impact with the finite resources I have. And meantime, uh, on some trunk roads and on speeds with the national speed limit, that's where we'll see the greatest number of casualties. Clearly, it, it's a mix of responses and tactics that we use. We're working towards reducing the number of child casualties along with the other partners for the 2020 framework. But meantime, switching suddenly a lot of resources away from faster roads into urban area, I don't think would give the same gain. And that's why I must decide to prioritise those faster routes. But every organisation has finite resources. You say faster. If someone's going 27 in a 20 mile an hour, and the implications of that are potentially more significant than someone going 75 in a, in a, a motorway. I don't think the figures bear that out. Um, the greatest number of casualties so far this year have been motorists, and typically those are motorists who lose control of their car at a high speed on rural routes. Um, and that's because of irresponsible driver behaviour? Sorry, I, 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 this Two very last, brief points. No, one more question, and then we've got, okay, we've thank got you. to move on. Um, sorry. Uh, also, very surprised at your comment about perceptions of um, enforcement being overly punitive. How would you gauge that? And can you explain what you mean by self-enforcing with regard to 20? Is that supposed to apply to other speed limits too? So, so firstly, in terms of punitive, um, I think we've already heard from um, one of the gentlemen to my right that the public have to see a law as being fair for them to comply with it. That's where we get the greatest level of compliance. Um, Secondly, in, in terms of um, the, the, the mes, me, methods of self-enforcement, that is a road layout looking and conveying to the driver signals that this, there is more risk, there is more danger. So the road engineers using signage, paint and, and other engineering things will convey to a motorist that there's greater risk. So in terms of the self-enforcing, that tends to be around housing estates. So where there are new housing estates being built up, we'd expect to see engineering measures that convey to the driver you should be travelling at less than 20. Where we started with this was 20s plenty, and now we're seeing local authorities promoting the 20s. But the driver needs to recognise uh, the type of road they're travelling on and, and comply rather than expect to see a police officer on every corner. So <laughs> OK, I'm just going to bring Mike Rumbles back in because he wanted to ask a specific question and I'm going to go on to Jamie Green. Th thanks very much, Convener. It is about my first question, but the supplementary I want to ask really is, is Kevin, perhaps Walter could answer this. Let's be kind to the financial <coughs> memorandum. Let's be kind to the financial memorandum. It said at the beginning when the bill was presented up to £10 million. But the evidence that we've received is that Edinburgh City Council is going to have a million. Rural councils in particular are going to have to spend millions on this. This is not, a, if I could say, a robust financial memorandum. And are you convinced that this is going to be value for money for councils if we operate reducing 20 mile an hour in this new system? It's, it's the value for money from councils that I'm particularly interested in. In terms of the, the, the costings, um, we were involved with the development of the financial memorandum. Uh, there was a cost report the Scott has prepared. I was the author of that last summer. Uh, and the figures there, the low end was 19 million and the upper end was 33 million. Um, which is fairly consistent with some other figures, no doubt, that you're hearing from local authorities multiplied up. Um, therefore, the financial memorandum, in terms of the, the drafting of that, took those figures and applied certain uh, considerations and assumptions. But we stand by that. It was a, uh, a pretty rudimentary model to develop the cost for implementation which, as I say, would not suit every single situation. It wouldn't suit every single council. But in terms of the range of councils we looked at, we felt that was the appropriate way forward. And as I say, the figures there were 19 to 33 million. I think in terms of the value for the local authorities, the local authorities have shown in terms of the current powers that there is uh, a reluctance to roll out 20s more widely. Um, we've got evidence of that right across the board. Uh, there seems to be a, a smattering or a smooth area, and then there's less smooth areas, and therefore local authorities in that regard are, with the passing of this bill, would be made, it would be made a duty, in which case that would impose upon local authorities the requirement to look at this, or at the very least to write it out. And I think at that stage, that's where the funding um, that's attached to this bill for local authorities is absolutely essential. Who wants to come in? 
Um, I just wanted to make two comments from a public health perspective. Firstly, um, well, from my own point of view, for our evaluation of 20 mile an hour in Edinburgh, and we're also doing it in Belfast, we are doing an economic evaluation of that. Unfortunately, that won't be um, until next year that that's available, but we are very much interested in the cost effectiveness of, of that. In terms of... Uh, public health intervention and whether this is cost effective. I can only talk from a public health perspective. This is actually seen as something where it's got high upfront costs. So you're talking about the millions and whatever, but when you think about how much that is over 20, 30 years and the gains you would have in terms of maybe reduction in, maybe not deaths, but maybe mortality and non-fatal accidents as well, it could... It brings it a bit more into perspective. You do have the costs of enforcement after that, but actually most of the costs are up front, and that's very unusual for a public health intervention. Often they're ongoing and they're very, very costly. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is linked to it, which is Jamie, Jamie Green. Jamie. Th thank you. Uh, it, it is linked, but I think we're moving around in our conversation this morning. I think that's fine. Um, just to pick up on perhaps following on from... Dr. Uh, Jepson, uh, is it the case then that this idea that you spend this money up front, you put in signage and then you stop there and you're expecting safety to improve, casualties to reduce, behaviour to change, enforcement to improve, data to collection to get better. Uh, it strikes me perhaps that there's not enough robust evidence to suggest that sign only uh, speed limits are enough and that by introducing the bill as it currently stands, Bearing in mind, the local authorities will have to foot the majority of this, and they've many are telling us they simply don't have the cash to do so. Is there another approach we could take to do this? For example, rolling out schemes across the country as and where they're required and as and where they're affordable to do so. Yeah, that is another option, and you know we know that the most effective ways to with a road architecture such as road bumps and things that would be more effective, but. Sometimes in terms of public health, you can have, because you're looking at a population level, so you're looking at the whole of Scotland here will be affected in some way by it. So for a relatively small amount of money in terms of total budget, even if you only get a small gain, it can still be cost effective. So it doesn't, in a way, it, it, it would be better to put in road humps everywhere, but actually that's much more expensive. So this is a cheap option that's probably less effective but could still have a public health benefit and still be cost-effective overall. And just before we get bogged down in the whether we should do road humps or signs or both, uh, and I don't want to go there at the moment, but uh, I was struck by something that Mr Young said earlier, and that's this idea, this notion that in areas where there is an obvious reduction in speed in a, uh, a hotspot area around a school or, or somewhere that you've identified as a local authority, that you need traffic calming. Do you think there is an issue around removing that obvious shift from a 30 to 20, that drivers know that there is a reason why they should be slowing down at that hot spot. And if you take those hot spots away, take that temporary reduction away, you somehow lose some of the benefits that you're getting at the moment. That's, that's very much the fear that we have just now, that the recognised people driving along there actually see these, sometimes they're, they're uh, temporary part-time during the day. So just when school's coming out, and at other times, depending on, on the area, they may be a more permanent 20 mile per hour. But people can actually see why they're there and the reason for them, and we think they're, they're more likely to comply because of that and more acceptant of them. And we do worry that a widespread introduction would dilute that effect. Is there any evidence, can I ask the police, is there any evidence of that, whether that behavioural shift from uh, going from 30 to 20 in these designated areas has a positive effect and the removal of them would alter behaviour in that respect? We probably see greater compliance with uh, 20 mile an hour where they are around schools. Um, there's been a lot of enforcement around those schools, not just to do with the speed limits, but also parking outside schools, a, a perennial issue. Um, so we do see uh, drivers reacting to that. Again, I, I say drivers need to understand what road they're on, um, the, the area they're travelling through and why the speed limit is what it is. Um, and therefore become self-enforcing that responsibility rather than relying upon uh, hard punitive enforcement. 
Walter, you wanted to come in, and then Andrew. Well, and I, I shan't get bogged down into the, the, the road humps and not road humps. What I would say is that is to pick up the suggestion that if this were to roll out, that everything would stop and nothing would happen after that. Um, each of the road and traffic authorities are administering and managing the network. We're picking up accident spots. We're looking at the data. There's still the day job to be done. It would just be slightly different because the, the baseline has changed in certain areas. So we would still be looking at those hot spots. We'd still then be able to target further interventions, be the road hump, be the engineering, to suit that location and that particular need. To apply that more generally across every single road and every single 20 across every restricted road would be disproportionate, but there's still the need for that proportionality and maybe that re further reinforcement of the 20 limits around schools and those hotspots. Andrew. Just a very brief point on the issue of 20 mile per hour outside schools. Uh, we are really trying to encourage uh, children to travel actively to schools, to and from schools. Uh, to do that, parents have to feel that children are safe on their entire journey, uh, not just 200 metres locally outside the school. So, yes, there is an argument that says drivers may be more compliant directly out the school, but there is also the issue of the portion of the journey that's out with that part-time 20. So if you restrict it to a short length, it has less of an encouraging factor. Thank you. Um, Colin, yours is the uh, next question. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, convener. Can, can I come back on a point, first of all, that, that, that Mr Young made um, around the Scottish Borders policy at the moment, which is very much to focus um, on areas around schools, um, which a lot of local authorities clearly start there. Do, do your current casualty figures show that, that most of the accidents involving pedestrians and cars are around schools or is, are, are they in other residential areas? Thankfully, we, we don't have a lot of pedestrian casualties at all. And statistically, there's, there's no difference between around the schools and other areas. Um, very unusual to have, like the police colleague had said earlier, most of our issues are on the, the 60 mile per hour or the, the uh, national speed limit routes. Within towns, very uh, thankfully in Touchwood, it's very unusual to actually have pedestrian accidents. And those that do occur tend to be very low speeds tend to involve reversing vehicles, that type of thing. Okay, but, but there's no real sort of evidence to say that around schools is it's a bigger but, problem than, say, a, a residential area next to a play park or, or whatever. No, there's no evidence, and there's no... Statistically, the numbers wouldn't allow any evidence to be presented on that basis. And, and the other... It's interesting. The other, the other point you make in your policy, or, uh, the statement you've made as a council, is that the cost is an issue, uh, rolling these out as a cost. Um, and certainly, one of the, the feedback we get from, 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 from certainly in my area from, from people is that there's a frustration that the process takes so long. It's a very bureaucratic process. Can the existing process be improved to lower the cost and potentially widen the areas and make it quicker for you to roll them out? Or is it purely you've decided that actually, for a variety of reasons, it's only around schools? Um, it's, the, the process is a, is a national process that you go through the regulations. Yeah. So there's, there's can, can that be improved? Can, can there be changes to made to the national process? I'm sure there can. I'm sure it could be more streamlined. But there's obviously there's a, a process to go through, with, as with any traffic regulation order. And there's you know, statutory consultations and things that have to happen. So it is a long, relatively bureaucratic process as it stands. Yeah. And, and, and just, just, would you envisage, as a council, given the policy around focusing on schools, that if this bill goes through, you will pass orders to effectively go to 30 mile an hour in lots of restricted roads in your area, or will you just accept that that's what, that it's going to go to 20 mile? I appreciate I can't, I can't, I can't judge what your, your councillors may decide at some time in the future, but will, you, will your judgment be that actually, because you've got a policy focusing very much around schools, you'll then pass orders if this bill goes through, turning what would automatically be a 20 mile an hour limit under the bill back to a 30 mile an hour limit away from schools? That, that would obviously be a policy decision for the council. Uh, what we'd be looking at uh, is that deciding if this was to come through as a bill, we would anticipate that there'd be widespread 20 mile per hour and we'd perhaps look at the arterial routes through the towns and that would be the decision. But it would only be the arterial routes. Okay. Whether we'd... 
I'm going, to br I'm going to bring Mark Ruskell in and, and try and focus this more nationally than, than just one particular area. So, just, Mark, uh, just a, a question for you. Yeah, th <coughs> thanks, Convene. Just a brief question. Um, Scottish <coughs> Government guidance is that 20 mile an hour should be the norm in residential areas, and yet you know, we are seeing quite a variation in how seriously that Scottish Government guidance is being taken. I just wonder if there are any reflections from the panels about why that is the case. Why is it that... We have some local authorities like borders that don't really want to implement the guidance while others are going a lot further such as edinburgh um Can I Walter, Walter, would you like to, to yeah I'll, I'll maybe start this off on just to maybe speak on behalf of, of brian there i don't think it's a case of not wanting to because the scottish borders are taking things very seriously in terms of the 20 mile an hour rollout and whatnot as are many authorities i think there's a certain degree of of timeliness and willingness to look at the, the guidance, 86% um, of the respondents, and sorry for quoting figures, I'm quite happy to make these available um, to the committee for your consideration, 86% uh, of councils that responded have a policy, a plan or a strategy in place for dealing with 20s. Having said that, we don't see that transferring down to the actual rollout of it, where you've got about 20 odd percent who will have rolled it out completely. You've got about 20 percent who've rolled it out in most places. You've got 30 percent who have got it in some places, and you've got 30 percent who've got it hardly any anywhere in that regard. And therefore, the actual application of it and the implementation of that particular guidance is subject to some kind of um, filter. I don't believe necessarily it's the, the complexity or the time scale or the uh, of the democratic process, I would hasten to add, in terms of the traffic regulation orders. It's not necessarily just bureaucratic. Um, it does need a certain degree of guidance. It takes something to shake things up. The initial policies that were set down and the guidance that came out of, uh, out of uh, Transport Scotland at the time brought that to the fore. Councils considered it. It's been five plus years before anybody's actually since they've updated their plans on average, and it's five plus years since they've looked at 20 seriously. And therefore, I think this is the opportunity for councils to reappraise that. So I think in terms of that, every encouragement in terms of the, the aspirations and the implementation of the bill is required. Um, however, it is then for the local, local councils then to see how best to implement that locally. Does anyone else want to come in on that before I go back to Colin for his, his next question? Kevin. Just very briefly, I was actually involved in the, the working group with uh, Transport Scotland in developing that, uh, the latest 20 mile an hour guidance. Um, and I think since that time, one of the, one of the, the key issues for local uh, authorities has been around funding. And the other key issue has been around um, knowledge, experience and staff resources within the, the, the councils, because a lot of the knowledge and experience has disappeared over the last five years. And that, that has been a barrier, along with the fact that um, funding for these kinds of initiatives has been uh, very thin on the ground. Right, I'm going to go back to Colin. I think you've got a question for Ruth. Just, just a brief question, Ruth. You mentioned earlier that, that you were carrying out assessments on the impact in Edinburgh and also Belfast, but unfortunately they're not available at the moment. That work's ongoing. Do you have any current assessments um, on the effectiveness of 20 mile an hour zones where they have been rolled out? <clears throat> well, so we started two years ago when it was during implementation, so we've been collecting data for the last two years and we're due to report in August 2019. At the moment, we have just started analysing data from one full year after implementation because we want to see it at this, you know, different time points as long as we can after it's been implemented. I can't tell you much at the moment, um, apart from the fact that speeds have reduced by about 1.5 mile an hour, as expected. Um, in some areas, it's, it's a bit higher than that, mainly on some of the main roads in some of the initial zones one, two, and three. Um, the other thing, we look at perceptions of people, and there's... It's this thing about people don't think they don't want it at the beginning, like say 25% 20, a quarter didn't want it um, at the beginning, but a year later that's reduced to one in five. 
So it's, uh, it's with, as with some other public health interventions or transport, this is a, I think of it as a public health that people think they're not going to like something, but actually when it happens to them, it, it's not as bad as they, they think it's going to be. So really that's all I can tell you at the moment. We, we are starting to do work on casualties, but that's already been reported by others. I think there has been a reduction, but that's a long-term trend that there's reductions in casualties. So, yeah, that's about all I can tell you, I'm afraid, at the moment. Can I just ask for, for yes. a point of clarity? Um, you said that, I think, that on some roads, speed limits have dropped by 1.2, was it? Did I... No, it's about one point. Sorry, I haven't got my numbers in front. About Roughly, one point six, about one point six mile an hour. One point six. That's miles the an hour. average over the city, okay. but so you know, it's it's different. In it will be different in different areas, and you know, that's a okay. an average rather so, than. Uh, it, that actually is important when you look at the speed that they're travelling. Yes. That, that they've reduced from. So what speed were they travelling at so we that has seen it, this reduction? We looked at it in two different ways. We looked at it as an average, so just the average reduction. And then we looked at people that were going over 24 miles an hour. Um, and the reason we took that number was because we made the assumption that 20, people tend to go 20% over any speed limit. And the reductions were higher than, they were up to 2.3. I think, I think you're misunderstanding. I'm talking, right, sorry. I'm, I'm trying to identify that when the speed limit was 30 miles an hour. Oh, right, sorry. What, you are now seeing a reduction. So presumably you would have done an assessment to say when it was 30 miles an hour, 90% of drivers were travelling at 23 miles an hour because that's all they could travel at in Edinburgh. And the speed limit has dropped by 1.6 or whatever it is. Is that the way you've done it? I mean, I, I'm confused slightly is, is, is that... I'm trying to work out how many people are travelling at the speed limit of 30 miles an hour in Edinburgh and therefore to see how big a reduction and how big a change this is going to make. So before they were travelling about 25 miles, that was the average speed. And 25 miles an yeah, hour, average uh, speed. But this is over the whole of Edinburgh that's taking... OK. So it's a very... Um, so that was on the faster roads as well as yeah, the slower roads? Yeah, that's the overall average, and now it's reduced down by about 1.5 miles an hour as an average okay. over the whole of Edinburgh. But you, you will see variations in different places. OK, so... We uh, haven't yet done all that analysis because okay. it's actually incredibly time-consuming. Um, I'm absolutely sure that's incredibly time consuming. I think that the point I was trying to get to is, is to find out how many people were doing 30 miles an hour in Edinburgh. Um, we before. haven't done that analysis yet. Well, that, it, then it's difficult to see how, how much the shift has happened. Stuart, sorry, you want to come in? Do forgive me as a mathematician. Mm. Uh, we're talking means, and actually I think I'm more interested in medians, to be honest, because I don't care if the law-abiding people are reducing their speeds. That has no impact on safety that we need to worry about. What I'm interested in is the people who are significantly exceeding whatever the speed limit is. And I want to kind of know what effect changing the speed limit from 30 to 20 is having on those people who are the people who are likely to be the source of greatest risk. Because you can have the speed coming down 1.9 miles an hour or whatever number it is by, though, by the conformist people reducing their speed while the, those who are significantly over have not reduced their speed by a single mile an hour. Kind of which is it, and will your research ultimately yeah. tell us that? And I think I was sort of answering the wrong question last time. In the response to your question, when we did look at those that were going over 24, so over 20% over, there was um, a reduction of around two miles an hour. So it did, we, it did reduce more in those that are going at higher speeds, which is what you want. Okay. And I think what I completely agree with you. I would like to do more analysis of that sort as well, because it's, t it's a too blunt instrument just saying it reduces by X amount an hour over the whole of the city. We need to know, well, is it the speeders? That, are they reducing theirs? Yeah. Yeah. Stuart, I think you ought to answer that question as well. The, 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 the people who are really seriously exceeding the speed limit, speed limit have those, the number of those... Uh, reduced since the introduction of the 20 mile an hour speed limit? That's a difficult um, question for me to answer. Uh, I don't have those, uh, th those figures in front of me. What I would say is that those are the people that we're most concerned about and will target. And where we see the greatest compliance with speed limits uh, is where there's engineering and average speed cameras. 
So you can see a, 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 on that. Uh, if we think again of the city of Edinburgh, Old Dalkeith Road, where there is the, the first urban average speed camera system, the compliance levels there are, are very high for all motors. But you will always have those motors who will choose to break the law and drive at high speeds in a dangerous manner. And th those are the individuals that we are most interested in catching. Good. Maureen, yours is the next question. OK, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, morning, panel. I suppose um, my question is mainly directed at you, Ruth, and following on what, from what you've been saying already. Have you, done, uh, in, have you done any work into finding out whether 20 mile an hour speed limits help increase the levels of walking and cycling uh, among people? We are, do, we are definitely doing that. That's one of the, the things we are looking at. But again, because just because where we are in this process. Is if it had been a year later, this committee, I could have given you lots of results. Unfortunately, I'm not able to give you those results yet, but we're definitely looking at that as one of our major outcomes. So, anecdotally, is there any, any evidence of that at all? I think we can only go back to the Edinburgh pilot, really, which uh, suggested that there was increases in cycling and walking that, from that um, evidence. And other evidence, we know there has been small increases. But I can't, yeah, I'm, fortunately, I just can't tell you that at the moment from our study. You, you'd like to come in on that? I was actually going to refer back to the pilot study mm -hmm. we did in South East Edinburgh several years ago, which did show uh, an increase in walking and particularly a fairly significant increase in cycling within those areas because of the, primarily the increased perception of safety on the road network for pedestrians and cyclists. I mean, I'm particularly interested in whether this bill um, will have any impact on placemaking and whether neighbourhoods are going to feel more safe, feel more um, that people feel that they can let their children out to play more safely. I wonder if any of you have considered that in relation to this bill. Walter. Yeah, certainly um, the placemaking element is uh, a huge opportunity. I think we've, we've focused in terms of the questions, which is quite right, on the casualties and safety and some of, some of the numbers uh, that we're looking at. But the opportunity with that more general rollout of, of 20 mile hours on our local placemaking across the board will still need to be focused in certain areas. And as has been identified, we'd, we'd still need to engineer. So when we're placemaking with engineering, we would be looking at using our TROs as currently to bring those areas down to 20. But ultimately, at last stage, this would then uh, give us the encouragement. I think it, there's a, an additional E there in terms of the encouragement to see that more widely and therefore make <laughs> most of our streets our places where we live and we play and we, and we work in that regard. Um, the roads that aren't suitable for that, that's where the, the characteristics would be slightly different and that's where that local consideration needs to come in. And that local consideration shouldn't just be from traffic engineers looking at it. It would have to be from lots of different aspects, including placemaking. And therefore, I'll be hopeful that if, if we were to go away and do uh, have more time and resource to do that more detailed assessment, the guidance for that could identify these other areas that we would need to open up to then bring into the full consideration. And placemaking is certainly one of those. Andrew, tendency did, sorry, I think Andrew wants... Mm. Did you want to come in, Andrew? Sorry. Uh, very briefly, yes. It was just sorry, to say that uh, our policy now is that any new residential street should be designed for a 20 mile per hour street, uh, speed limit. And what widespread 20s allows you to do is design your roads in a different way, so that they are more people friendly, they are more orientated towards pedestrians rather than through traffic. You can widen footways, cut down radii at junctions, make crossing points narrower, things like that, that you might hesitate to do on a 30 mile per hour road, but with a 20 mile per hour limit, you can fundamentally roll out a different lo road layout that's more people friendly. I mean, in some places, there are even shared spaces now where there isn't a distinction between the pavement and the, and the road. It's just there for everybody. Surely that's an area that must have a 20 mile an hour limit. You want to come in there? Just as a supplementary to that, and very briefly, that um, the current design um, guidance from government very much points towards designing for placemaking and for um, a, a design speed of 20 miles an hour. The problem that creates for local traffic authorities at the moment is they have to promote a, an order to make that 20 miles an hour. If the bill was enacted, 
it would default to 20 miles an hour. So there would be less administration going forward in the long term for, the, for these new streets that are being built just now. Just, just to follow up on that, I mean, a lot of, a lot of what we've heard today and, and in previous sessions is um, that this would make it easier um, because of all the rigmarole and bureaucracy you've got to go through at the moment. It's coming back to the finance of it. You know, we've heard that it will cost our local authorities such and such and such and such, but to me that doesn't take in what's already being spent on. I mean, for example, how much has Edinburgh spent already on making 20 miles an hour? What's the budget been over the past five, ten years for this? Uh, well, of course, we, we rolled out 20, it's under the current legislation. Mm -hmm. So the cost of that, the recent rollout, which covered about 30% of our streets, was about two and a half million pounds. Had the bill been through, uh, we've not done a direct cost on how much it would have cost us, but I would expect it would probably have been somewhere less than a million pounds for that same rollout had the bill been in place. Uh, just because of the, the different way it would, it would have had to be done. So there'd be a significant saving. Uh, if another authority that hasn't rolled it out of the way, we have wanted to take that forward in the future if the, the bill became law. Okay. Um, thank you. I think the next question then is Jamie Green. Jamie. <clears throat> thank you, Convener. Um, before I do ask my question, which is on a different topic, I'm quite intrigued by a theme that's come up from Maureen Watts line of questioning, and that's this concept that somehow roads will be safer uh, if you reduce the speed limit. And I don't mean at the point of, for example, an impact in an accident, but this concept that if a road is currently a 30, it's for the car, but if it's a 20, it's much more of a shared space. Surely roads are dangerous at 20 or 30 miles per hour for pedestrians. Who, who'd like to answer that? Um, Stuart, do you want to go on that? I don't think you can apply that generally. We've spoken about uh, young people, actually. Uh, the, the casualties that we see, um, the great number of our elderly pedestrians, we've heard already about risk around large vehicles moving through cities um, and in car parks, where a very, very slow speed collision can lead to a fatality or serious injury. And the other area, we, we spoke there about placemaking and making our, our town centres attractive. A large part of that is tourism, nighttime economy. And actually, that's where we then see a greater risk um, to pedestrians who are distracted and or intoxicated. Reducing the speed limit, uh, though, from 30 to 20, in principle, if speeds came down, then the scientific data tells us a collision at a lower speed is less likely to result in such serious injuries. So if the general principle is to lower speeds, then that may, over time, have the, the public health benefits that we're seeking. That's very helpful. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, oh, well, just uh, you, very you quick can come in very briefly and then... Just a quick supplementary in terms of that. I think the, the, um, the actual impact and the consequence of that, of those kind of accidents, are clearly lower in terms of that. The frequency of accidents when you're reducing the speed to, to 20 also reduces. I think there, there's evidence that the committee have already heard in terms of that one mile per hour uh, results in 6% reduction in the, the, the likelihood of uh, that kind of contact being made. And then, the, as I say, there's then the, mm -hmm. what the consequences of that to factor in as well. Thank you for that. But it also sounds like, from evidence given, that the majority of fatalities occur at higher speeds anyway. So, um, Can I ask about the environmental aspects of this? Because there, there's a lot of discussion when you talk to people about this bill. Uh, there seems to be a suggestion that if cars are driving more slowly, uh, they are polluting the environment more, um, etc. Now, there are numerous academic reports on this, some running into the hundreds of pages, and I have heard every side of the argument on this um, to leave us all the more confused as a committee. Um, I, I don't really want to get into the in-depth science behind this, but I would like a general view, if there's an overarching view, as to whether 20 mile per hour driving is more, less, or the same uh, in terms of its uh, effect on emissions and local air quality? Ruth. So, um, last year we had two master's students who looked at this in Edinburgh, because we knew it was an issue. Um, so, they looked at both particulates and emissions, and 
looked at it in 20 mile an hour zones in Edinburgh and non 20 mile an hour zones. Basically, it's it's inconclusive or it's it's likely to be minimal the effect and it could go either way but it, it's not a big problem as, as that's the best we know and we are replicating that again a year later this year as well to get some more data on that and then I'll bring in Stuart and then Kevin just just very briefly chair I'm just going to make the point that it's not the sort of the 50 percent reduction from 30 or the percentage from 30 down to 20 it's the two mile per hour difference so it's almost a kind of moot argument and the other thing is I think it will be overtaken greatly by the reduction in diesels and the implementation of electric cars so I don't think it's the most important part of this argument Stuart you want to come in um, just back to the maths uh, is the pollution emitted by our uh, petrol or diesel engine not related to the number of ignition cycles and nothing to do with the speed whatsoever. In other words, that if you are operating in a lower gear because you're driving more slowly, the number of ignition cycles for distance covered has increased. And therefore, the amount, the amount of emissions coming out of the tailpipe per mile increases if you're in a lower gear. Or is that to misunderstand the mechanical nature of how things actually work? I don't know, Stuart. You've managed to get everyone to look in the opposite direction. Um, so maybe, maybe Kevin, you'd like to try and address that uh, uh, along with partly the question that Jamie had asked before. Thank you very much, convener. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a civil engineer. I'm not a, an automotive engineer. So in terms of Mr. Stevenson's question, I have got no idea. Um, well. In terms of an overarching view, I think the point that Brian has made is probably, for me, um, one of the most important points. The vehicle fleet is changing and it will continue to change dramatically over the next 20 years. And that's probably um, where I would be coming from, that, that the emissions issue will be dealt with in other ways. To, to come in on that. OK, well, we'll move on to the next question then, which is Richard. Richard Lam. Thank you, convener. Um, I'll refer back to another question uh, which wasn't asked earlier. Um, cultural change has taken place over the last number of years in various things. Uh, drink driving, smoking in pubs. Do you think cultural change could be could come in when 20s plenty come? Uh, you know, over the years, be 20s plenty. Could be if we make it national. Could there be a cultural change to drive at 20 rather than 30? So it looks like Andrew. Simple wants to yes come or in. no on that one. Andrew, do you want to give a yes or no answer? Uh, well, it wasn't the answer I was going to give, but the answer is yes. You don't have to give a yes or no. <laughs> That's one of the most important benefits we see for Edinburgh coming out of the bill, is at the moment, decisions to bring in 20 mile per hour speed limits are made at a local level. There will be an element of the local population who doesn't agree with that, um, maybe doesn't... Uh, put the same value in a decision taken at a local level than they would in a change to the national legislation. And it carries a far greater weight if it's national legislation. It also brings in the possibility of national advertising, national promotional behaviour. Uh, that's a lot, that's, that's out of the reach place. of local authorities. So, yes, I think it's very valuable. Richard, can I bring Stuart in? He's, he's keen to answer on that yeah. one. Yes. Uh, if I may borrow a phrase from a uh, violence reduction unit, and that is that road violence uh, is preventable, it's not inevitable. We need to make inappropriate speeding and exceeding speed limits as socially unacceptable as drink driving. You know, at the end of the day, it's no rocket science. People are speeding, going faster and faster and faster. So two cars hit together. If I hit, you know, if you hit somebody at, at um, particularly if you hit somebody at 20, they've got more chance of surviving than if you hit some day at 30, right? That's, that's the, what, what's not, what we don't see in our televisions nowadays is speed kills. All the advertising that tells us that driving at a speed or that, and you see the nutters when you're on the, the motorways going at 80, 90, um, you know, and, and we all uh, see them. So basically, the next question I want to ask is, in the last couple of sessions, um, in fact, I get into, I get criticised on Twitter 
because I asked a question about bus times. But we've had conflicting evidence on uh, if we reduce the times or reduce the speed to 20. What effect, and, and some uh, members actually have touched on it, are you aware of any evidence that 20 mile uh, per hour speed limits result in longer journey times or increased traffic congestion for both buses and people going to their work? Ruth, do you want to come in on that? Yes, so we're looking at this too in, uh, in our evaluation. I spoke to John White um, about two weeks ago and I think he was going to put out a statement or something, but basically it hasn't made any difference, the 20 mile an hour to bus journey times. I can't tell you about anything about passengers or anything like that, but in terms of the bus journey times, he thought there was much other things going on in Edinburgh, like work, roadworks or whatever, that had more of an impact than the 20 mile an hour. I should add that in Edinburgh, as part of the development of our network, we did consult with bus operators quite a lot on this issue. And it was one of the factors that we gave quite heavy consideration to when we were deciding which strategic routes to leave at 30 miles per hour was the ones that carried heavy, heavy bus services. So it may be that part, part of the reason why there's not much impact on the bus services is a lot of the bus routes are still 30 miles per hour over much of their length. Stuart, you wanted to uh, come in. Uh, briefly, just two points. First of all, buses tend to actually restrict traffic flow. It tends to reduce speed. So absolutely, we do not want then people overtaking at high speed. And whilst it's still very early, an average speed camera system in Mill Street in Rutherglen, which took the speed from 40 down to 30, early indications are that traffic flow is better. And I certainly know that Transport Scotland, in terms of the trunk roads, uh, report better traffic flows where traffic <laughs> behaviour is regulated and speeds come down. So I, I would say yes. So basically, going down to 20 miles per hour will make no difference to people's journey times. It could actually help to ease the traffic uh, and could actually help to ensure that people get where they want to go safely during the busiest times, but again, it's getting drivers to comply with that at two o'clock in the morning. And I refer to what I said earlier, just because the roads are much quieter and therefore higher speeds can be achieved, the risks are not removed. And we've seen a number of pedestrian fatalities in the last year uh, due to drivers travelling at high speed and not seeing a pedestrian. Yeah. You want to come in, and then the, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to the short next supplementary. Question. In terms of that, I think the, there's, there is a focus, quite rightly, in terms of the, the city environment and that denser population. What I would say in terms of our bus routes is that it would need local consideration. One of the reasons why the arterial routes that have been mentioned are likely to stay as 30s would be to allow for that kind of traffic and consideration for bus services to get from their major points of A to B. When they then get into that urban environment to do their pickups and drop offs, that's where the drop to 20 would be advantageous to them as well. Stuart Stevenson. Stuart. Uh, thank you very much. We've had a fair bit of discussion over TROs, but I want to just br relatively briefly explore. Um, some other aspects of that. Now, Andreessen in particular suggested that it cost Edinburgh two and a half million to do what they'd done using TROs and that it might, might have been, and I put it no stronger than that, a million. So that's 40% of the cost it, uh, under the new arrangements. It might, it might have been a million. So that's 40% of the cost. Would it be possible to simplify the traffic regulation order to make the costs of that an order 40% of the current costs, which would be an alternative cost of effective way of this legislation? Uh, well, I mean, the first thing is that the, the cost of the TRO process is only a very small part of the overall cost of implementation. That's mainly around the signage, uh, and the bill would obviously change the signage requirements. So that's where the main saving financially would be. Um, th it would be possible through legislation to change the TRO process that could make it cheaper and quicker and easier to do. Um, there's a balance to be hit with still allowing local democracy and people having the opportunity to, to view and comment and object. Um, the TRO cost of the process is not massive, but it involves a lot of work and a lot of time. Uh, our citywide TRO uh, that we did in 2016 to introduce speed limits on 30% of our network involved individually listing 2,500 sections of street. Uh, just to put that into context, so somebody's had to go out and actually schedule up those lengths of road. Um, can, can you give us just a 
some understanding of how many people were involved for how many uh, person hours? Oh, in terms of person hours, no. Um, we have a fairly small TRO team. Uh, it's got about three or four members of staff in it, and they're obviously working in TROs for all sorts of things. The citywide order was um, prioritised to get it through. In addition to the one citywide order, because it took us several years to implement over the whole city because of the amount of streets and signs we had to do, for each individual phase, we then had to do a second TRO because the street network changes over time. So new streets are being built, uh, some streets are being altered. So we had to, over that period, run four separate supplementary TROs that made amendments to the original <coughs> TRO. And as has been alluded to earlier on, we've got developers building new streets in the city on an ongoing basis. Every new street, as it's built currently, needs a TRO well, raised to make it 20 miles per hour. Right. Let me, let, let me just pick up on the point that came from uh, Kevin uh, Hamilton uh, and in West Lothian and Lothian, where the A's and B's were designated restricted roads. Would that have reduced, if you had taken that approach in Edinburgh, would that have reduced the signage cost, which you're identifying as the big cost associated with the present system? Well, the, the signage cost is based on the current regime where you have to sign every 20 mile per hour road with repeaters. Um, that's not so much whether it's a restricted road or an unrestricted road, it's just what the speed limit so, is. So, so therefore, we, given that if we make 20 the default, yes. the repeater signage requirement goes away, I understand, and I'm getting a nodding head, so I must be correct. Therefore, the bill in that context, if implemented, could could have made a significant reduction in cost, or am I, and yeah. if so, is that where your two and a half goes down to the one? Is that what you are, yeah. yes, I'm getting a nod, that's fine. Um, I think I've probably covered it, Camilla. Okay, thank you. Uh, then the next question, I think, is Peter Chapman. I think, Peter, that's yours. Um, and well, we're, we're, we're on the repeater signs issue again. And I mean, should the bill be passed, the, as we understand it, there will be a requirement to take down the repeater signs where, where this, this has already happened in, in Edinburgh, for instance. Um, I just wonder, is this a cost worth paying? Is there, a, is there any real reason to, to remove signs which are already there under the, the, the scheme you, you've, you've, you've put in place? Um, if this bill passes where there was no requirement for repeater signs. Is there, a, is there any real reason to take them down if they're already up? That's my question. Who'd like uh, to go? Uh, I'll, if, if I can come in just from, yeah, from, from, the, from the national perspective in terms of that, it is all about consistency. Uh, I think we recognise that we wouldn't want to be taking down some great work that's already happened in, in City of Edinburgh, but in terms of their recognising the benefit of having that consistency across Lothian, across Scotland, there is the benefit of not being confused in terms of, well, that particular location reminds me this is a 20, and therefore you might get into a little bit of a, a lull false sense of security when you go somewhere else that is equally a 20, but you're thinking there's no repeaters and therefore I'll drive a little bit quicker. So I think there is a, a need in terms of a rationalisation of that signage. It's not just the signing, it's also the, the lining. Uh, and I think there's a, a reasonable presumption in that regard that we, uh, if it were to go forward, we wouldn't be suggesting going in and burning off those kind of linings. We just allow those to degrade over time, uh, whereas the signs themselves are much more readily removable. It would be an exercise. It's a, a relatively costly exercise in terms of that, but I think the benefits would accrue nationally in terms of our consistency moving from one local authority area into another. Stuart, did you, did you, uh, sorry, Andrew, did you want to add to that and then I'll bring in Stuart? Uh, just slightly, I mean, there are other options. Uh, under the current way things work, you sign by exception. So you don't sign repeater signs for the default spent limit, but you, you sign everything else it would be entirely possible to change that and say you sign everything. But there's obviously an additional cost associated with that as well. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's something that could be dealt with in a different way, but under cur the current regime and the way things work currently, you would have to take them down. Stuart, do you have a view? I do have a view, and that is that investment in good signage uh, tells the driver what the speed limit is, but I appreciate that the costs of applying consistent signing it is very expensive, but it is something we look at at fatal and serious accidents. We look at 
uh, signage leading up to the location. We look at how well that's maintained. Um, and there's nothing better than stopping a speeding driver at a repeater sign and, and asking them, what was it that told you to go faster? Mm. So it's about, again, that fairness of getting people on board to understand that is the speed limit, uh, but accepting that that's out with uh, the, the police's remit in terms of finance. But I mean, just to respond to that, if this bill is passed, the repeater signs would, would, would need to come down, uh, which is basically going against what you've just said, uh, Stuart, and, and that, you know, signs, signage is always good. Basically, that's what, you know, you said, you said that it's never a bad thing to have, to have a sign in place to remind people, but under this the bill, the, that repeater signage in, in Edinburgh, for instance, would, would need to come down. That's, a, that's the point I'm, I'm making, yeah. Um, Briefly, Richard, and then we'll move on to the next question. On the factor of signs, and maybe Stuart Carroll can, can tell me, or otherwise, lawyers, traffic lawyers, could make a, a good business out of this, could they? Um, they, they might, but if the, no, if the bill is properly enacted, I'm sure it will be in whatever form, that that will be taken care of. But um, when people are, are building a defence, uh, yes, they will rely upon if there's some default. There wasn't a sign, uh, Chief Superintendent. I never saw a sign. That generally wouldn't be a defence, so if you're driving on a restricted road just now, um, that tends to be. But uh, appreciating that, I think, giving clear messages without clutter uh, to, to motorists, because that's another issue that can, can arise from too many signs. But I think for speed roundels and, and speed roundels on roads, they do help. Thanks. Richard, on the basis you've tested your defence and it's not going to work, uh, the next question is John Mason. <laughs> John. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, both for the present and the future, I mean, obviously, most funding for local authorities is local authority funding, and that's it. But, I mean, do Sustrans or Transport Scotland, I mean, can they, when you're rolling out 20 mile per hour or any of these things, do they provide any technical support or financial support or anything like that? Who'd like to go on that? Uh, Walter. Yeah, it, I think there's, there's a, a range of, of funding mechanisms that local authority are pretty adept at tapping into. Uh, if there are such funds from Transport Scotland, uh, we will be there. Uh, and similarly and specifically in terms of Sustrans, um, I think the beauty with the Sustrans bidding and the opportunities there is that you are inevitably building in some of these considerations for placemaking, for the speeds that you can be looking at, and therefore as part of a Sustrans bid, as part of a project that has a Sustrans element, then it's opening itself up to opportunities for that cross-funding that would actually serve both, both purposes. But in terms of anything specific coming out of there, any specific requirements coming out of the funding that is currently available or has been available, uh, there's nothing which links it to the, the 20 mile an hour limit. You wanted to say something? Uh, from Edinburgh's experience, uh, we did make use of quite a lot of funding that came in either through Sustrans or through uh, Scottish Government grant funding through Cycling Walking Safer Streets towards the initial implementation of 20s. I'm not entirely sure we'd be able to use that funding stream for altering signs mm -hmm. to comply with change signing requirements resulting from a bill, where effectively you're keeping the speed limits the same, but just altering the signage. Yep. OK, thanks. And uh, the other area was, in the financial memorandum, it specifically mentions Police Scotland and suggests that the police would have a saving, and the figures are 320 to 562,000 eh, if there were fewer and less serious accidents. I mean, I have to say, I would have thought the police will just do something else instead, so there wouldn't actually be a saving, but can you comment on that? Yes, the, the, the resource will switch to other areas, but you know, we have to investigate the, the accidents that, that, that take place, but I think that saving is, is negligible in the, in the bigger gains to be had here. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the figures are quite small. I, I suppose just, you know, is it actually fair to say there would be a saving at all? Or, I mean, the overall police budget would not change whatever we do with the speed limits, would it? No, it wouldn't. No. And I, th I think that figure is ascribed by the cost of investigating, attending and investigating yes. an accident. So yes. if there are fewer collisions, then that element of cost is taken out of, of, of a particular budget line, but it will be spent elsewhere. OK, that's great. Thanks so much. OK, John Finney, you've got a question. Uh, a question, I think, primarily for, for Dr Ruth Jepson. Uh, Dr Jepson, uh, how do the road safety, health and placemaking policy aims of the 
bill measure up against the financial cost? Clearly, there's an overlap between a number of issues there. So that again, the last I'm saying bit. clearly there's an overlap between a number of issues. That, that, that. Can you comment on that, please? Can you say the question yes, again? Yes, um, I was wanting to know <laughs> how the road safety, health and placemaking policy aims of the bill measure up against the, the financial costs. I'm not sure I can actually answer that at the moment. Um, it is something we're looking at again. Um, we are particularly interested in what we call, you've all called it different things, we call it livability, so how safe and pleasant our streets are to live in. But I, we haven't done any economic analysis of that at the moment, so I'm sorry, I can't answer that question for you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Jamie, you had a follow-on question to that. Thank you. That leads nicely into my next question. I think given that there is a very comprehensive and quite substantial piece of work going on into Edinburgh's experience of 20 mile per hour zones, which is, as far as I can tell, the largest to date in Scotland, do you think it would be sensible or prudent uh, for this committee and for Parliament to wait and see what comes out of that analysis before we take a view on whether that should be rolled out across the rest of Scotland? Um, that's that's an interesting question. I suppose it is the biggest. It's actually one of the biggest, probably that's been done anywhere. Um, we're also looking at Belfast as well, but it's it's difficult for me to say. Partly because Edinburgh is Edinburgh, so it's very context specific in a way. So what happens in Edinburgh might not be the same in what happens in some of the smaller rural areas. Um, it will give us some indicative. Um, estimates of effectiveness, it will give us estimates of effectiveness or cost effectiveness as well because we're doing quite a robust analysis of that. Uh, I wouldn't like to make a judgment on that really. <laughs> Does anyone have a view? Maybe, maybe I could bring Brian in. I mean, do you, do you feel it would help inform your position? Um, I think there's probably enough evidence throughout the country already. I wouldn't expect the Edinburgh information to to differ greatly from that. Um, you can never have too much evidence. Um, whether it's a reason to delay things, not sure. Um, briefly, Walter. Yeah, briefly, I think the, the, the national applicability, we've already used the City of Edinburgh experience in trying to, within our cost reporting and the work we've done, to see how that would apply against a typical authority or a range of authorities. Um, so I don't think waiting for that will give us anything, anything more in terms of applicability. I think if we were to consider uh, time to consider and build more evidence in terms of that, then I would suggest that's for uh, to direct the local authorities and to provide the resources for local authorities to look at that local implementation in the 31 other authorities so that we do have something which is much more definitive. But by then it would be too late because we will have passed the bill which rolls out nationally and then our capital safety produces a report which may produce evidence to the contrary. So my point is, is it not better to get that first before we then take a view on the rest of the country. I think, so we're at interim time now for it. So the direction of effect is roughly the same as what's been found elsewhere. So I don't think there's going to be anything surprising. It's just that probably some of the effects that have been found elsewhere will likely to be replicated. I don't want to say too much because I'm a researcher and I've got to keep with this as interim results. But, you know, the fact is that at the moment we've got similar levels of reduction in speed as in other areas that have done the same thing. And I think things will... I can't imagine it being hugely different, to be honest. But I think what you, the actual information you will have is probably something about the economics of it that hasn't been done elsewhere, which will be pretty robust. And we're doing that in Belfast as well, which has a different model. It's just got the city centre. So, in a way, it's quite a nice comparison to see, looking at the cost-effectiveness of one versus the other. Okay. I, I, I think... We're going to have to leave it there, just purely because we're, we're short of time. I know there are a couple of people who wanted to come in. I, I apologise for that. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel for coming in this morning and giving evidence to the committee. It's always very helpful to hear the views of a variety, wide variety of people. So thank you very much for giving us your time this morning. I'm now going to suspend the meeting literally for five minutes to allow the panel to depart. Thank you very much.
very much. I'd like now to re reconvene the, pan uh, the committee, and I'd like to welcome our second panel. Uh, I'd like to welcome Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity. I'd like to welcome Donna Turnbull, the Road, road Safety Policy Manager. And I'd also like to welcome Stuart Wilson, the National Operations Manager. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we're going to go straight into uh, questions. And the first question is from Richard Lyle. Richard. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Can you outline the Scottish Government's view on the proposals in the bill and advise whether and how this view has changed since the publication of the Atkins Department for Transport Research and to the effect of 20 mile per hour speed limits? OK. Um, I think um, the bill is trying to achieve uh, two things. One is um, obviously uh, looking at the issue of uh, introducing a standard 20 mile an hour uh, speed limit across uh, restricted roads. Uh, and alongside that, part of its purpose is to achieve that uh, is to help to support a greater provision of uh, active travel uh, and the benefits that can come from uh, a 20 mile an hour uh, speed limit. One of the things that um, uh, we've been considering with the bill is that um, there are a number of challenges with it uh, in that the bill in itself um, uh, we don't know the numbers of restricted roads in Scotland. Uh, there are some restricted roads, actually, which you wouldn't want to have as 20 mile an hour zones. There are roads which are not restricted that you would possibly want to have as 20 mile an hour roads as uh, well. Um, so as the bill stands at the present time, um, uh, we don't think it's the most effective way in which to actually take forward the agenda uh, around trying to uh, get a greater number of 20 mile an hour zones in the right place or roads in the right place. Uh, the Atkins report, I think it confirmed that one of the, the key things is it's important that if you are looking to introduce a speed limit on a road, uh, that there is a, a number of measures that you have to put in place in order to achieve that effectively, uh, in order to encourage compliance with it as well, because effectively uh, uh, speed limits are self-enforcing uh, to a large extent, as the police would tell you. Uh, that uh, the design of the road, the other measures you put in, are all important elements in helping to support compliance with a, uh, with a speed limit. Uh, so, to some extent, that report, I think, reinforces our view that just taking a blanket approach isn't necessarily the best approach uh, in order to, uh, to achieve what we're trying to get from uh, introducing 20 mile an hour zones. So, you wrote to committee on the 30th of October 2018, now. <coughs> Go back what you said. We believe that more evidence and more detailed analysis is needed before the measures proposed in the restricted roads, 20 mile per hour limited Scotland bill can be fully supported. Do you still stand by that? Yes. Thank you. OK. Um, I think, I'm, John, I'm mindful that, that that's very close to the, the question you indicated you asked. I'd like to bring Mark Ruskell in first and then come back to you, John, if I may. Just, just a brief supplementary convener. It's, it's about the Atkins report. Um, I just wonder if you or your team had engaged with the conclusion of Atkins, which is that there is better compliance uh, when 20 is rolled out on a wider area-wide basis rather than just small, discrete little zones outside of schools. Is that, is that something you recognise, that area-wide is better? And if it is better... So you're referring what? to 20 mile an hour zones as opposed to 20 mile an hour roads? But that's not what the bill proposes. Um, I'm, I'm referring to the approach that Atkins studied, which is area-wide, wide area, 20 mile an hour limits uh, across wider areas, including Brighton, which they concluded was more effective than discrete little zones outside of schools. So, for example, if you, if you look at, for example, a city like Edinburgh, uh, the way in which they've gone about doing it with, uh, what, 80 per cent of the roads uh, which are covered by 20 mile an hour, as 80 per cent of the roads are covered by 20 mile an hour uh, at speed limits, However, the criteria which they used for arriving at that was somewhat different uh, from what's proposed in the bill. Uh, they used a different criteria uh, and a range of different characteristics in coming to that decision. So I think what the Atkins report uh, reinforces is that, um, is that there's a range of different factors that come into play when you're trying to get effective 20 mile an hour limits on roads or compliance with speed limits. Uh, and that zones are one of the elements that can help to support that. Um, uh, uh, that's the approach that was taken in Edinburgh, but that was a different approach from what's been proposed in the bill. Okay. Because some of the 20 mile an hour roads in Edinburgh are not restricted roads. The criteria was very different. 
Okay, I think we'll move on then to the next question. John, uh, you wanted to ask something. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, referring back to that letter again, where you talked about um, doing some analysis of evidence and uh, the Department for Transport was one of them, and then you talked about working collaboratively with others. Can you see who the others are, and can you give us an update on the evaluation you've made of the evidence you've received as a result of that exercise, please? So there's obviously the Atkins report in itself, but there was also the... Um, uh, uh, one of the drivers behind, I think, the purpose behind this bill, and certainly from the discussions I've had uh, with, uh, with Mr Rusko, is the concerns around how the TRO process operates and the way in which local authorities, there's a, there's a, some local authorities are more proactive with them than others, and there's concerns about where it's unduly bureaucratic, takes too long, etc. So part of the work we've been doing with Scots and also um, uh, with uh, COSLER is looking at the existing TRO process. Uh, uh, the feedback we've had so far is that, by and large, uh, they believe it is a robust mechanism. It's one which allows local communities to be engaged in the process, that they, um, uh, that they uh, think it's an effective mechanism. However, there are issues about whether we could streamline it in some way uh, to make it a quicker process. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we've been having those discussions with them. We're now in the process of about to issue a questionnaire to all of the local authorities. Um, uh, uh, in order to get further details from them around the TRO process. Uh, that will be taking place in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and once we get that feedback, we'll then be in a position to look at distilling all of that information and that evidence together to then decide upon what other measures can we take forward to help to support and encourage 20 million hour zones to be introduced, or roads to be introduced in areas where it's appropriate to do so. Thank you. Uh, can you confirm a time frame for that? You say the letters go out the next couple of weeks. What, what's the turnaround period and the period for analysis? I'm so, before I ask Don, I'm about to say a wee bit more about <laughs> that. Um, as far as I understand, the questionnaire has now been drafted. This has been done through one of the working groups. We have the questionnaire has been uh, drafted. Um, we're going to the next few weeks. I would expect to get feedback on that over the next couple of months. And I would expect in the autumn of this year uh, to have all of that information collated together. Uh, alongside the discussion we've had with uh, with COSLA and Scots around uh, what measures we could look at taking forward. Do you want to say a wee bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that time frame's realistic, and I suppose it depends on what comes back from the questionnaires themselves, but what we hope is it's a trigger for a ongoing, more intense engagement with local authorities so we can better understand and get into the detail behind some of the processes and really get their views and thoughts around any mechanisms or any part of the process which we can streamline or make a bit consistent across Scotland and how they do things. So I think autumn is probably a good time. It would be fair to say to Mr Finney, some of the feedback we've had is that it, some of the local authorities feel as though if there was a if there was a, um, additional guidance around some aspects that would allow it would assist them with consistency and approach. Um, as well. So these are all things that we can look at doing and once we've distilled all of that we'll be in a position to look at the measures that we then take forward. Okay, Th uh, thanks for that um, Cabinet Secretary. Would it be possible to share that feedback and indeed share the questionnaire with the committee please? I'm more than happy to do that, yes. Okay, many thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Jamie, uh, I think you still have a question on, on this process as well. Yes, I'd, Jamie. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for answering the question I had yet not asked, but uh, it's an uh, excellent talent. Uh, <laughs> Maybe I'll rephrase See if I can do it, it better uh, the second time round. <laughs> indeed, I'm sure it was adequate the first time. Um, I, I, one, I mean, clearly what's, what's happening here with this bill is you have a situation where the default uh, is that there's a 30 mile per hour road and the local authority needs to uh, go through a process piece of work uh, to uh, alter roads that they think would be better suited as 20. The bill seeks to do the reverse as such, that the default will now become 20. And if a local authority feels that a road should be a 30, they will go through a similar process. But part of the problem that there is a need for perhaps such a bill like this is the fact that there's criticism of the current processes, the time scales, the cost, uh, etc. Uh, if this bill were not to pass, would the Cabinet Secretary give a commitment um, to the committee or indeed to, to Parliament that any um, areas of concern that local authorities have where they really do want to implement 20 zones within their authority areas, that the government will make it easier for them to do so uh, and will help rule out as, as and where it's required? Look, I think the, the member raises a, a, um, a fair point. Um, that's part of the reason that, that we've engaged in this process with COSLA and Scots is to understand where the issues of concern are. 
Uh, but let me give you a practical example. Um, one of the issues of concern which has been raised is the, is the time frame, uh, the length of time it takes to actually go through the TRO process. Actually, a significant part of the time which is associated with the TRO process is the is a consultation exercise. Um, what I'm not keen to do is to see communities uh, losing the opportunity to be involved in that consultation exercise. However, there are two parts to it. There is the statutory consultation element and there's also the, uh, uh, the public consultation element. There's two parts. It, both of them actually... Um, uh, 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 one takes place before the others. It's statutory is first, or it's statutory first, and then it's a public consultation. So one of the suggestions I've made is that could we bring the two of those together so they could run simultaneously? Um, now, if we can do that, I I'm more than happy to look at, uh, at taking forward that as a potential option. But I don't want to start seeing communities curtailed from being able to actually engage in the consultation process as well. So there's a balance to be struck there. But I'm certainly open to looking at how we can improve the system uh, and if it helps to speed up the system as well and gets greater consistency of application of it, uh, then I can give an undertaking to the committee that I'm prepared to do that. And the exercise we're undertaking now is to try and help to achieve that. And is, isn't part of the problem, I've spoken to a lot of local authorities about th what's in this bill and a lot of the feedback and concern they have is the fact they just simply haven't done that mapping exercise, nor do they have the resource and time to do so in advance of any potential bill that would come into play, of which roads they would want to put the speed limit up. And also, don't you think there's perhaps a general issue around this idea of putting speed limits up as opposed to bringing them down? Do you think that would then, as part of that consultation process, come up against more opposition uh, when seeking to take something from a 20 back up to a 30, just from a perception point of view? But I think, I think Mr Green's latter point is a good point, uh, because I... Um, I very rarely in my constituency get representations from communities opposed to the idea of going to a 20 mile an hour road or 20 mile an hour zone. But I suspect if they were expecting to go to a 20 mile an hour, a 20 mile an hour zone or road, and then they said, actually, no, we're going to put yours up to 30, I would get a significant level of representation people being opposed to that. So as ever, people feel as though they're, they're losing out in, in something. So I think that's a, that's a, a reasonable point to make. I think it's important to recognise as well, convener, is that I've listened to some of the debate in, uh, uh, over the last couple of weeks around this bill in the media, uh, and people often refer to cities, uh, towns, where they've introduced um, uh, this a blanket type approach. This is a bill that's intended to apply it not to a town or a city, but to a country. Uh, and we are in a situation where our local authorities don't have the information around the restricted roads. There are thousands of restricted roads in Scotland, but because most of it was done in paperwork um, over uh, many, many decades, uh, it would be a massive undertaking for individual local authorities to go through in order to actually collate all of that information and to identify that information. And I go back to the earlier point I made as well. So if you look at what they did here in Edinburgh, it wasn't just in restricted roads. It was in the roads that they thought it was most appropriate to go to 20 miles an hour. And there will be roads which, in my view, uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for them to go to uh, 20 miles an hour. And I think we're creating a process that I think is unnecessary, uh, but would be better if it was driven at a local level by identifying the roads in the areas that they think should be zones or 20 mile an hour limits. Thank you. John, you wanted to come in. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'm always very frustrated about this, this phrase that we don't know. Uh, local authorities have an obligation to have an asset register. Local authorities are obliged to know what they own and what they... Um, what they uh, you're obliged to inspect things and then repair them. Now, I know you'll say this has nothing to do with me, this is a local authority. You're the Cabinet Secretary for Transport. It does seem passing strange that we don't know the categories of roads across Scotland. Would you not agree? So they won't, they won't know um, on the basis of um, historically how they've been kept, the records have been kept. So, for example, prior to... 1996, uh, with, the, uh, with the disaggregation of councils, is that there will be um, a whole host of uh, uh, restricted roads which were applied previously, which the local authorities will have now, but because they've not had to deal with them, uh, they, will, they won't have collated that information. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, it has been done as a paperwork exercise over many, many decades. I agree with you. That's a frustrating point. Um, it would be easier if it was all in one single database, but the reality is it isn't. Uh, and uh, and uh, identification of restricted roads going through that process would be an extremely time-consuming and detailed exercise for individual local authorities to undertake. That's just the reality of the situation. 
You wouldn't anticipate, therefore, that they'll be coming to you making representations for funding to maintain these roads in that case? Well, these are roads which are local authority roads anyway, which yes, they do, which they do, which they already have, but the whole process of going through, but they, they have unrestricted roads as well, which they're responsible for. Uh, so it's not just the restricted roads. They have a whole host of different roads which they're responsible for. Uh, so uh, that's a process that they would have to go through uh, in order to, to, to get the database, to get a level of data uh, uh, that allows them to understand what impact this bill would actually have in their respective areas. OK, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say, I, just a general point, I, I, it, it's difficult to manage the, the questions if we're all struggling to answer the same, ask the same questions that, that, that we want to ask. Um, <coughs> can I just ask members just to be careful that, that we try and keep to the, the questioning areas that we, that's agreed, because it just means that some members then look at me with, with a grievance saying that they've had their question answered. So uh, just moving straight on, Mark, you want to come in and then I'm going to come to Maureen. The convener, I mean, I'm, I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned the, the sort of work within the implementation group, which indeed, you know, I've been working constructively with uh, Donna Turnbull and Cosler and Scotts over some period of time. Um, I don't think the Cabinet Secretary has seen some of the early survey data that has come back ahead of the autumn, where obviously more work can be done. Um, about 21% of local authorities have responded to say they already have the roads identified, uh, which they would wish to, uh, to switch to 20, and those that would, they would wish to retain as 30. Um, and another 29% say they have the asset data to allow roads to be identified. So, you know, there already is some progress for some local authorities. Uh, I guess my question is, how do you, how do you ensure that there's consistency? Because there is information coming back from local authorities that even if the process was simpler, they still wouldn't necessarily uh, stick to Scottish Government policy and introduce 20 mile an hour residential areas. We heard that clearly from Borders Council this morning. Your own local authority in Falkirk has introduced virtually no 20 mile an hour limits in residential areas. And yet if you go across the Kincardine Bridge in Clapman and Shed, virtually every residential area is 20. So I, I, I'm asking you about whether you believe that a simple sort of change to the TRO process would actually have any effect at all, because that contradicts what we're hearing in evidence that's coming back from some councils. Yeah, well, let, let me just pick up on the point you said there about 21% of local authorities already have that data uh, to hand. That means nearly 80% don't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing it, but I'm yeah. saying that that means that nearly 80% don't. Um, uh, between 70 and 80% don't have that data. Um, so that's a major undertaking for any local authority. It's good that we've got some local authorities that are in that position where they have that information, uh, but the vast majority clearly don't. Right. Um, uh, so we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't um, uh, dismiss that. In terms of uh, what you call um, uh, it, it, the work that we are doing now and the inconsistency of approach, that's exactly what we're trying to understand from local authorities. So why are there neighbouring local authorities that take a different approach around 20 mile an hour road limits and also 20 mile an hour zones? And what can we do uh, around process and guidance and information we provide them with that can help to achieve a more consistent approach as well. And once we've had that feedback from them, we'll be in a better place to understand what we can put in place to assist them uh, in making sure we get a greater consistency of approach across local authorities. Thank you. Uh, I think the next question is from Maureen. Maureen. Thank you, Convener. Morning, Cabinet Secretary and panel. Um, there is an argument going that creating a national 20 mile an hour speed limit on restricted roads would result in that cultural change in attitudes to vehicle speeds, which um, in effect may produce um, results greater than that created by the current piecemeal implementation of the 20 mile an hour um, limits. Uh, can I ask what your view is on that? I think um, uh, there is a one of the things that's very clear is that um, drivers take a number of different factors into account when they um, are looking at the, sp the, the speed at which they're going out in the road, the design of the road, the layout of the road, where it's got lighting, etc. Uh, a number of different factors. Uh, and these are all issues that need to be taken into account in trying to achieve compliance with any speed limit, including a 20 mile an hour um, at speed limit. Uh, and uh, the, the issue of... Um, uh, one of the biggest challenges you will always have in any aspect of trying to change uh, behaviour is trying to create cultural shift, uh, which by and large will take much longer uh, and can be much more difficult to achieve. 
So um, my view is that uh, is that the best way in which to achieve the type of cultural shift that we're looking for is to make sure that we are placing 20 million an hour limits and 20 million an hour zones in areas where we can most effectively ensure compliance with them. Uh, and the range of other factors that need to be put in place in order to help to support and achieve that. Uh, and uh, we know that just placing the speed limit doesn't work in itself. Uh, uh, the other factors that all have to be taken into account to encourage compliance with that are extremely important. Uh, and that's why I, my view is that it's better if we do that on the basis of where we think it's most appropriate and can be achieved and we'll get compliance. Uh, and in that sense, we'll get the cultural shift that's necessary that goes along with that. But that always takes time. OK, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, uh, I have a question is from the evidence that we're hearing, uh, there seems to be a, 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 a p different views on 20 miles an hour speed limits, depending whether it's councils with large rural areas or councils with large urban areas. Um, <coughs> a lot of the ones in rural areas feel that a, a blanket, a 20 mile an hour speed limit that doesn't seem to be appropriate. Um, I, I just want to push you slightly on this is, is do you think that the councils if you do are in a position to amend the TRO, are the best people to make the decisions in the areas relating to the roads that they control with, on the basis they have local knowledge on where those 20 mile an hour speed limits should be? I do, yes. What I do accept, though, is there's an inconsistency of approach across how local authorities are doing that. Um, uh, I'm conscious in councils such as Highland Councils, they have long uh, rural roads, uh, uh, that may be restricted, uh, uh, may not be restricted, that would be affected by this, that they would then have to look at changing. But uh, uh, my view is that it, it, in order to achieve the type of compliance that we're looking for, the benefits that come from that, uh, the best way in which to achieve that is through a local process, identifying the roads, identifying the areas, and then taking forward the measures that help to improve compliance with these types of limits. Uh, rather than just taking a blanket approach and then having to unpick from that the bits that we don't actually want to have 20 mils on our own. OK, thank you for that. Um, Colin, I think you had a, a, a question there. Th thanks very much, Convener. We've, we've talked a lot about the sort of process um, and issues around consistency and uh, you know whether or not the existing TRO process can be improved to speed it up or, 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 or how we get more consistency around local authorities. But what, what I'm not clear about is really what what the government's vision actually is in terms of what, what is the final outcome. Do you believe that, that, that across Scotland we should have in place um, something like Edinburgh have in place, where residential areas are effectively 20 mile an hour zones, or do you think we should have in place almost like the borders where it's simply just around schools? What, 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 is, what is the position of the government? What do you want to see? What's your vision for speed limits in, in residential areas across Scotland? You know, Because uh, we, can, we can talk about the process, how we get there, but actually, what do you want to achieve as a government? Well, look, the, 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 the Scottish Road Safety Framework uh, up to 2020 sets out the approach that we've got as a government. Um, uh, and that includes areas such as um, uh, 20 million hour zones uh, and 20 million hour uh, speed limits and uh, all the work that's set out within that in order to look at reducing uh, 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 casualties and injuries that are caused by uh, road traffic accidents. So, uh, so we've got uh, the framework uh, that sets that out. Uh, what we're not intending to do, though, is to direct local authorities that you must do X, Y or Z in your area. Uh, because there will be different environments where it will be appropriate and our areas it will not be appropriate. What I'm hearing is that there is an issue about the tools that they have got that they feel as though they could be improved for them. Uh, and that greater guidance or clearer guidance to them could help to support a more consistent approach around how they apply uh, 20 mile an hour uh, speed limits and 20 mile an hour uh, zones. Uh, and that's the process that we're undertaking with them just now. What can we do to help you to take a more consistent approach? But, but that is still to leave local authorities to decide on how they apply that within their respective areas. So I don't think it's for, for government to tell Borders Council where they should put them. What I think we should do is make sure we're giving them as much help and support as possible around the guidance and information to assist them in making decisions about it and to look at the process which is used uh, for coming to that to make sure it's one which they feel is fit for purpose and is helpful to them.
but in the end it would be the local elected members that then decide upon where exactly they choose to put them within their respective areas. But, yeah, but ultimately there, there will be differences across particularly rural areas compared to urban areas, but we have a situation at the moment where a house and estate in a town and a house and estate in Edinburgh one has a 20 mile zone, another part of Scotland, it doesn't have a 20 mile zone, even though actually that residential area is almost identical in those two areas. So I'm just keen to know, does the government believe that it's 20 mile zones in that residential area is the right thing to happen? Or in the case where it isn't happening, is that, is that your view that it shouldn't happen? Just to, I mean, I know that we talk about, about local decisions, but that... You know, we have we have a situation where two identical places have a different speed limit across Scotland. I just I'm keen to know what what side the government come down on uh, on that issue because of course that will guide whether or not um, your, your desire in terms of having consistency is about increasing the number of 20 mile hour zones yeah. significantly across Scotland, which I believe needs to happen, or it's just about um, I don't know improving the speed of a TRO. Yeah, no, we're, we're in favour of 20 mile hour zones where there's a good evidence base for actually for for them being introduced, uh, and we would encourage local authorities to do that. Um, uh, but there is an inconsistency in how local authorities go about doing it. I'll ask Stuart maybe just to go through uh, just some of the criteria which we, we do set and we ask local authorities to look at in arriving at those decisions. Uh, so, for example, if one decides that that housing estate is going to be a 20 mile an hour zone and the other one chooses not to, are they applying the same criteria? Uh, so there's a consistency in the outcome that they come to when they're considering the matter. Thank you. Uh, just think the key message we would like to send is the right limit for the right place. When you look at the current speed limit guidance, it's very clear that consistency and legibility are important. So a driver in North Lanarkshire or a driver in Falkirk should have a common understanding of a road given the environment they're sitting in. And then coming back to the, the, the kind of point that was made earlier, having worked for Falkirk Council for five years and having worked for North Lanarkshire for, for preceding five years, those two local authorities came to different positions in terms of advisory is based on exactly the same evidence base because they had resources and plans that set out the merits or the non-merits, if you wish to call it that, of doing exactly the same thing. I think looking at the network we have just now, we have roads and as you know, a transport agency, Transport Scotland has sought to deliver 20 mile an hour limits on certain parts of our network where we felt there was the evidence to do that. There are other places where we will not do that because we think the evidence doesn't support it. And again, for local authorities, it's very much the case. I think the, being able to make the choice based on the evidence available to them, the community inputs, these things are important. And you know, one of the thresholds we've used in terms of the pilot 20s we looked at was an average speed of 24 miles an hour or less, reflecting the guidance that these limits should be self-enforcing. The input we took from the police at that time that said these limits have to work without additional enforcement. And it comes, it comes back to these key questions of, if you do something, do you expect it to have a benefit? And yeah, residential side streets in any place, I think it's reasonable that these limits generally should be down around 20. There's no argument about that. But there may be main roads running through the collectives of residential streets, which are equally restricted roads, where there's less of a case. And there'll always be a margin round about that. And there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And I think that's the kind of key thing, the right limit for the right place is where our current guidance and what the road safety framework and the road safety plan talk about. So just to be clear then, because at the moment, nobody would dream about taking a house in a state where it's a really built up area and having anything other than 30 as a maximum. Mm. Nobody would have that. And that's a national policy. Mm. So uh, you, what you're saying is that your, the desire of the government is that that should be 20 though in a built-up residential area such as that? When you look at our strategic road safety plan, it has 20 actions in it. Nine of them talk about speed management. We recognise completely the idea that managing speed effectively is a good thing to do. It comes down to that managing speed effectively and changing speed limits are not necessarily the same thing. But there are plenty of places where you could point to a road network and say, this is obviously a 20, it's a restricted road, or it's not a restricted road, as Edinburgh have done it's perfectly appropriate for it to be a 20. What we're not in a position to do is actually drop a map of the network just now and give you the picture of what that actually looks like. So, in, in Mr Smith's Mr. point about how you could have two housing estates, identical housing estates in two different local authority areas, one which is a 20 mile an hour zone and one which isn't, is that from our approach, we would see it as being most likely to be a 20 mile an hour zone. But the fact that that local authority has arrived, not arrived at, at, both the local authorities haven't arrived at the same decision, Part of what we're trying to undertake just now is to look at what we can put in place 
to help to achieve a greater consistency. So the one that's decided it's not a 20 million dollar zone, actually the position saying actually that would be a better to be a 20 million dollar zone. But, but that consistency is trying to get into 20, isn't it, really? It, it, in, in areas where we can see there's a good evidence base to justify doing that, yes, that's what we would expect to happen. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, yours is the next question. Thank you, Convener. Um, we've heard a lot about the uh, financial memorandum of uh, this bill uh, and the support levels that the government may or may not offer local authorities to implement the bill if it was passed, uh, including some concerns that the cost of implementing the bill may have been underestimated in the first instance. Does the government secretary have any views on that and whether the government would be minded to give additional support to local authorities, specifically financial support, to implement the bill if it were passed? Well, we do believe, we do think the costs have been underestimated. Uh, the reality is we don't know what the costs will be uh, for introducing the, the, the proposals within this bill. Uh, uh, large on the basis is because of the uh, issues around unrestricted or restricted roads. Um, we don't know the numbers. We don't know what the costs will then be uh, for its implementation. Uh, we have to keep in mind that there is the additional process costs so of uh, councils going through the process of actually collating this information, then if they choose to have some restricted roads as 30 miles an hour, pro uh, 30 miles an hour, they'll have to go through the process, a TRO process, to take it up to 30 miles an hour, the costs which are associated with that. Uh, there are, uh, we can maybe give you a couple of examples just to see where we think there are uh, costs of not because as Stuart can maybe mention in terms of within the, within the trunk road network, there are around 40 areas that we've identified. Um, uh, you maybe give a bit of an insight into the actual costs that are associated with those roads if we were to introduce a 20 mile an hour limit in those areas. Yep, thank you. Um, hey, Stuart, yeah. if I may encourage you. We have put in a couple of 20 mile an hour limits, and if you extrapolate that cost, the simple change would be about £1 million. If we added the need for buffer zones, reflecting the fact that national speed limit roads with 60 coming straight into 20 might not be advisable. Doubling that cost to £2 million is our current approximation of changing restricted roads on the trunk network to 20. Sorry to, to interrupt. And I, can I just go back to my original point, though, and that's a very specific one, is that if the bill, if Parliament cho chooses to pass the bill, will the Scottish Government or not give local authorities the additional funding they think they need to implement the consequences of the bill? Because they're saying to us they don't have the money, so it has to come from somewhere. Well, there's no, there's no allocation within my budget for the purpose of delivering this bill. So if Parliament was of the mind to support this piece of legislation and Parliament passes it, uh, any financial support that we would have to give to local authorities, and I recognise we would have to give them financial support to assist them with this matter, um, we'd have to come out of existing budget allocations. Um, uh, that would have to be determined at the time. So it would have to come out of the existing budget. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you for that answer. Maureen, yours is the next question. Thank you. Um, we heard in an, the earlier evidence session that um, some council, I think it was maybe Edinburgh, had uh, accessed support um, through SUSTRANS and active travel funds. Is there an opportunity for further rollout of that to happen? Do you mean using the active travel budget mm -hmm. for, for this type of work? Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, we've given, that, given that if there were 20 mile an hour zones, um, the lady who was doing the research suggested that there would be more active travel, especially cycling, if there were more 20 mile an hour zones. Just so I understand you correctly, it, that we use the active travel budget for the implementation of this bill that was passed by Parliament. Mm -hmm. That potentially could be an option, um, uh, but we don't know what the cost will be for the introduction of this, this bill. Um, we do think it has been significantly underestimated, uh, uh, so we don't know what those costs would be. But if we do that, then that will have an impact on all of the other active travel measures which we take, uh, uh, which, uh, which would be to their detriment. Thank you. Thank you. The next question then is Peter Chapman. Peter. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, should this bill be passed, okay, Cabinet Secretary, there will be a requirement in places like Edinburgh to remove the repeater 20 miles an hour sign, and that's what the bill says. Would the government consider changing the regulations so that in that circumstance there wouldn't be a necessity to remove the 20 miles per hour repeater signs? Because obviously there's a cost to put them up, but there's a cost to take them down as well. 
Of course, and uh, as it stands at the present moment, uh, you don't put repeater signs on 30 mile an hour roads. Um, so it's not a requirement for them to do that. So if the default became 20, um, it would seem logical to say that you would uh, take away those repeater signs or the requirement for those repeater signs. However, I think there are issues around a, a shifting culture and compliance, etc., which would then suggest you actually probably should keep those repeater signs, actually you may want to increase the numbers that you've actually got. Uh, these are all issues that would have to be considered. So we would give it due consideration if the bill was passed. Um, uh, uh, but you are correct, and there will be a cost attached to that as well. Mm. OK, I'm happy. John, yours to the next question. Pursue the point that Mr Chapman's just made, because, I mean, at the moment, uh, we have guidance, as I understand it, that they're not allowed to have repeater signs within 30 mile per hour zones. I, I mean, I have like a, quite a major road. It's called Clyde Gateway. You may be familiar with it. It was the new road built in the East End, which feels like, well, it is a dual carriageway. It's got two lanes each way, no parking. It feels like a 40 or 50, and people drive at 40 or 50. I would like, the community would like 30 mile per hour repeater signs on that, but the council said they are not allowed to do that. Is that something you would at least be willing to look at in the future, whichever way we go on the speed limits? I'm conscious we're into the technical regulations around uh, speed limits. Maybe I ask Stuart maybe to comment on that. I suppose coming back to that point, is that the right limit in the right place? You know, if people's expression is that the road is faster, I'm not in detail for of the reasons why we don't put 30s in. It's to do with the regulations, which are long-standing. But I think, as Mr Matheson says, if the bill passed, you could look to apply a generally similar principle to the idea of 20s. I'd have to come back to you with a more specific answer in terms of the you know, bringing 30s on. No, that's OK. I realise it's wider yeah. than just this bill. Yeah. I know the very roads mean, and I, and, I, and I can understand why you would have concerns about it. So I, I know exactly okay, where well, you are. I'd make that point in, in passing anyway. Yeah. But to, to continue with the financial side, uh, I mean, there is a figure in the financial memorandum, uh, I think, of 450,000, which is marked as marketing. Um, now, th I think that's based on previous campaigns to do with cancer and all sorts of things. Uh, obviously, if the bill was to pass, uh, even if the government's not keen, um, would the government certainly be willing? And do you think that is a reasonable figure to roll out this kind of a uh, marketing promotion, whatever we call it, uh, across the country, because it would be a major change if the default is 20 instead of 30. Well, look, when I was, um, and I'm conscious of another former public health minister here as well, uh, is that um, we often had a variety of different uh, 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 public information campaigns around a range of different conditions. Uh, by and large, a six week campaign is around about half a million pounds. Uh, in cost, in cost of preparation work, the research work, then the uh, media work and everything, and then also the, um, uh, there's an element at the end about uh, assessing the impact that it's actually had as well. And that's the type of uh, cancer information programmes. Uh, the issue of culture was raised earlier on. Um, creating cultural shift, though, takes a much longer period of time. My view, um, and I, uh, uh, my suspicion would be, is that if the bill was passed and we went to a 20 default, um, you need to go for a campaign that goes way beyond that for a six-week campaign. Uh, this would have to be an ongoing campaign over an extended period of time uh, in order to try and reinforce the message. Um, and obviously the cost would increase as a result of that. So um, I don't know how long it would have to be, uh, but I, I suspect it would have to be over an extended period of time. Uh, in my view, months, if not um, over the course of a couple of years, and reinforcing the message in order to get it home. I mean, I realise it's difficult if, to predict either the time or the cost. And, you know, some things that, like the smoking, I think actually smoking ban came in more easily than I think many of us had expected. I mean, could you put a cost on what you think should be in for this marketing or promotion? No, I can't. I, I think it'd be unfair for me to do so, other than to say that, I say, for example, when I was a public health minister, the average cost of a six-week campaign was about That's half a million right. pounds. Um, uh, so a campaign of this nature, which I think would have to be sustained over an extended period of time, um, you, know, you can do the sums, uh, depending on how long Two you million? actually wanted to. It, it, I suspect you are talking several million for an information campaign over an extended period of time. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank okay. you. John, you've got a question. John Finney. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, um, it's about cost-benefit um, ratio of a, a national 20 mile hour speed limit on restricted roads, Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, what, what's your view on that, um, given the level of casualty reductions predicted by organisations such as the Glasgow Centre for Population Health? Yeah. I'm aware of the work that they've, they've uh, undertaken, and, and, and to some extent it, it, it reinforces our view that uh, uh, the 20 million hour uh, limit should be put in places where we can actually gain the biggest benefit from them uh, and we will get the greatest compliance with them as well, which reduces the risk of casualties um, uh, from, uh, from road traffic accidents. Uh, so there are, there are benefits uh, that come from having 20 mile an hour road speed limits and uh, zones. Uh, and uh, that's why we think it should be an evidence base that's used at a local level to determine where they can best be achieved and it will get compliance with them. And, and just for the avoidance of doubt, the, the benefits include financial benefit. You talked about the downside, I think you talked about the administration costs of TROs, but um, benefit in terms of finance. Do you mean in terms of the, the cost benefit of having a 20 million dollar yes, zone? Yes, indeed. Well, the, the cost benefit of, um, if you have less accidents, the health costs which are associated with that, depending on the nature of the accident, potentially the long-term financial impact it could have on an individual if they are significantly disabled or injured from a road traffic accident. So, yeah, there are, there are, there are cost benefits yeah. that come from that. And uh, unpleasant though it may seem, and I touched on this very briefly with Police Scotland, what cost on a life? What's the cost of a, a, a child fatality? In, what, in, what, in terms of financial costs? Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, I'll ask Stuart, he can give you some details on that. Yeah, I mean, for the trunk network, and there are different costs for local networks, I think it's a little less, but a trunk road fatality is a little over £2 million. If you were to monetise the cost of that death, that would be the figure you'd put to it. And, and in relation to uh, Wales, and forgive me reading from this uh, convener, a reduction in um, between... Uh, uh, 1st of January 2011 and 31st of December 2013. Um, 14,639 people were killed or injured on 30 mile an hour roads. And the prediction was that reducing from 30 to 20 could prevent 6 to 10 deaths, 1,203 to 1,978 injuries per year at a total prevention of 58 to 94 million. So there are clearly it's wider than the costs of signs and some administrative inconvenience. Of course it is. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Mark, you wanted to ask a question. As a, a follow-up to that question, I mean, Minister, do you acknowledge that if we move to a national default 20 mile an hour on those restricted roads where people live, work and play, there will be greater numbers of reductions of casualties, more lives saved than the current piecemeal approach of what we see in place today? I think potentially that's the case, yes. However, um, uh, in terms of, we know the evidence is that in terms of compliance, there's a range of different factors that drivers take into account in complying with the speed limit. And that includes road design uh, and uh, road features and the location of that particular road. So for example, mm -hmm. if there's no housing there, et cetera, or how people feel as though they can go faster. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we think it's better that we actually address that at a local level where they can identify the areas where we can get the greatest level of compliance and we will get the greatest benefits at a yeah. local level from that. So I, I appreciate that you wish to drive compliance further and further. I, I wish to do the same, but do you acknowledge that even with a modest speed reduction, of say one to two miles an hour, which is what the bill is predicated on, we will still save more lives on a population level basis than going for a piecemeal approach with lots of lumps and bumps outside of schools. Well, I, 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 and I understand, because our, our view is that the greater use of 20 mile an hour zones and roads is, right. is the right thing to do in order to help to reduce risk, casualties, and also right. to make people feel safer. Um, our view, though, is that that should be taken forward at a localised level in areas where we can get the greatest benefits of that rather than doing it in a blanket approach, uh, which is what the bill is proposing to do. Uh, and if we can do that in a way where we get greater levels of compliance, then we will reduce potential casualty impact, the health impacts and everything that come from that, uh, 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 rather than actually just doing it on a blanket basis in areas where compliance might not be good. Because uh, as the police have said, is that effectively uh, 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 speed road limits um, are self-enforcing. 
Uh, and we shouldn't ignore that. And that's why it's important we take an evidence base to the areas that we choose to locate them in in order to get the maximum benefit from them. Just may I ask that, can I say that, final question? That, that's, that's to some extent... That's to some extent the approach that Edinburgh have taken, which is using a different criteria from what the bill is. They looked at a range of different factors in determining where they thought the 20 mile an hour zone should actually be. Uh, and they uh, didn't restrict it just to restricted roads itself in order to address <coughs> areas that they thought they could get better compliance with and they felt that it should be a 20 mile an hour zone. Uh, I'm, very, I mean, Edinburgh, briefly, very due briefly, respects, Edinburgh have rolled out a sign only uh, basis, but they have. They have also invested a uh, limited amount of funds in putting in additional infrastructure in areas where there is high, uh, potentially high casualty rates and high footfall. Is it, do you not see that, that, that within an area-wide 20 mile an hour limit across Scotland in restricted roads, it's still possible to target resources into areas where compliance is poor, whether that be enforcement activity of the police or additional investment by councils into speed reduction measures. So the two are not mutually exclusive. We have a blanket 30 mile an hour at the moment, switch to a blanket 20, and then invest in those areas where we see continued uh, compliance issues. So um, part of the challenge we've got is that we don't know the extent of the network that will actually be affected by the bill. So when you say that well, all we should do is... 50% of councils do, but yeah. Well, well, well we, we, don't, we don't know. That's the reality of it. So when you say that what we should do is just focus then on doing more compliance issues, then uh, to what extent will that be? Because we don't know the extent of the network that will be affected. Um, thank, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We are, we are just slightly ahead of schedule, and I think one of your officials is due to turn up shortly. So with the committee's agreement, what I would like to do is to move away from agenda item two move straight on to agenda item, uh, sorry, two and three, move on to agenda item four and five, and during that process that it will allow the Cabinet Secretary to adjust his officials uh, and we can move back to the, to the other agita, uh, agenda items. Is, that, is, is the committee happy with doing that? Yes. Good. Okay, so what we'll do then is move on straight on to agenda item four, and this is the consideration of one negative instrument as detailed on the agenda. The instrument will enhance the controls of the issue use and quality of horse passports. No mo motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? That's agreed. So we'll then move on to agenda item five, which is the European Union Withdrawal Act. And there are two notifications in relation to UK SIs as detailed on the agenda. The, the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Regulations 2019 and the Environment Miscellaneous Amendments and Revocations EU Exit Regulations 2019. These cover European regulations and directives related to spirits, food labelling, wines, genetically modified organisms, animal health and pesticides. All the instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Withdrawal Act 2018. The Environment, Food and Rural Affairs uh, Regulations 2019 is categorised as a Category B to the extent that the transition from the EU to a UK framework would be a major and significant development. Does anyone have any comments on this? Therefore, we need to agree a course of action. Does the committee agree to write to the Scottish Government to confirm it is contempt for consent for the UK SIs referred to in the notifications to be given and to note the wider policy implications? We are agreed. Uh, having completed that, I think we will take a five-minute uh, pause to, uh, to allow uh, the Cabinet Secretary's witness to uh, arrange. In fact, we'll do it till 11.30, so I'm going to suspend the meeting till 11.30. Thank you.
We now move back in uh, to session and we're going to move back to a deal with agenda item two, which is subordinate legislation in the form of an affirmative instrument to do with national bus travel concession scheme. Uh, this is to consider one affirmative instrument, the, na the Draft National Bus Travel Concession Scheme for Older and Disabled Persons Scotland Amendment Order 2019. The committee will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Con Connectivity. The motion is seeking the approval of the affirmative instrument will be considered formally at item three. Members should note that there have been no representations to the committee on this particular instrument um, and I would like to welcome from the Scottish Government Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, Pete Grant, the Bus Policy Team Leader, and John Finley, the Customer Services and Communication Manager for the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a brief opening statement? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Convener. The draft National Bus Travel Concession Scheme Order uh, and Disabled People Scotland's Amendment uh, Order 2019 sets the reimbursement rate and cap levels of funding for the National Concessionary Travel Scheme in 2019-20. In doing so, it gives effect to an agreement that we reached in December 2018 with the Confederation of Passenger Transport, which represents the Scottish bus industry. That agreement was based on an economic model for reimbursement that was developed in 2013 on the basis of independent research commissioned by the Scottish Government and following extensive discussions with CPT and their advisors. With CPT and our respective advisors, we have reviewed and updated the model uh, and the forecasts and indices used in the model uh, to use it as the basis for the proposed term for 2019-20. The proposed reimbursement rate in 2019-20 is set at 56.5% of the adult single fare. We believe this rate is consistent with the aim set out in legislation establishing the scheme that bus operators should, no be, should be no better and no worse off as a result of participating in the scheme. It is only marginally different from the last year's rate of 56.8 per cent, which, we, which we, will, we believe provides a welcome degree of stability for bus operators. On the basis of this reimbursement rate and our expectations for future journey numbers and fares, we had forecast that claims for reimbursement may come to around 213 million, uh, 300, uh, sorry, I should say 213.65 uh, million over the next year. This figure is reflected in the draft order as a budgetary cap. The order is limited to the coming year. Our work to update the model during 2017 identified a significant uncertainty around what should be at the impact of changes in relative level of adult single fare. We agreed with CPT that we would leave this key element of the model unchanged for the time being. The economic model relies on good forecasting and therefore Transport Scotland has built relationships with the industry based on transparent forecasting procedures. We know that older and disabled people greatly value the free bus travel that the scheme provides, which enables them to access local services, visit friends and relatives, and gain from the health benefits of a more active lifestyle. The order provides for those benefits to continue for a further year on the basis that it is fair to operators. I therefore commend the order to the committee, and of course I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And there are a few members that wish to ask questions. Could I just make an observation? There are a few members of the committee, and I'm not going to name them, who may be eligible for concessionary bus travel. They, there is no need for them all uh, to make a declaration, so that I will therefore spare, the, spare their blushes by, by saying that. Uh, there are some questions, and I think the first question is from Richard Lahm. Yeah, I, I, I want to ask a question, but also want to make a comment. I actually welcome that the proposal extends the scheme for a further year, makes no change to who is eligible for the scheme or what benefits it confers. This is contrary to what comments by certain political parties made in this place when the system was going to be reviewed. And, uh, and so I welcome the fact that the government uh, is not raising the age criteria or changing the system. And that was because of a public consultation. And you're on record in August 2018 
The Scottish Government confirmed there would be no change stage of the eligibility of the scheme. That would remain at 60. The Scottish Government also confirmed it would make a minor amendment, which is welcome to make uh, disabled children aged under five eligible for a companion card under the scheme. So thanks for that. But I have to ask, that's only for a year. So what future discussions are you uh, intermitting with? Uh, quite a number of bus companies in Scotland. I think someone in this paper it says there are over 220 bus companies. That surprised me. Bus mm. companies in Scotland. Um, so what future discussions are you having with each of them to ensure that this excellent scheme for, for people who use it, that, uh, that it remains the way it is? So, uh, can you the members correct in that we haven't changed the eligibility, uh, we have extended it to include children, disabled children under the age of five, and that's taken account of in this, uh, uh, in this particular uh, order. This is an annual process that we go through with the industry, so the, uh, uh, the process that we have, the economic model is one which was agreed with them, so there's a, a, a consistency of approach. Um, uh, going forward, and that's exactly what we'll do in the coming year with them as well. And we, uh, uh, we work with them in a collaborative way uh, around uh, 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 coming to this particular figure uh, and uh, uh, the process that we've gone through uh, and leading up to agreement in December was a collaborative one and one which was, uh, which was welcomed by the industry at the time and how we went about that. And that's how we'll conduct it in the year, the year ahead as well. So can you remind me again how much this costs the government? You know, uh, you know people wonder how we, we spend their money and spend their taxes. How much? How much is this going to cost? So the, the so government? the cap. So the cap for the existing financial year was two hundred two zero two point one million pounds, and for the coming financial year, uh, the figure is going up to two one three point six five million pounds. So two hundred and thirteen uh, million pounds that we that we invest in this scheme. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Well done. Thank you. I'm sure he appreciates that, uh, that comment, Richard. Uh, Stuart. Uh, thank, thank you very much, convener. Um, in, in the last year, uh, was the cap reached? And if it was reached, at what point in the calendar year uh, were the claims uh, that were received? Uh, uh, when did they reach the cap? Yeah, I'll ask uh, uh, Pete to give you some details around that. Um, yep. Uh, <clears throat> in the last year, the, the cap wasn't breached. So um, how, how, how far short of it were we then? So can I just be clear on what you were talking about? Uh, well, last year's cap, and I've temporarily forgotten what the figure is, but the, yeah. the two, two, 200 and point. whatever. Um, so yeah. the actual expenditure under the scheme, I'm asking, what, what was that? Yeah. So in terms of the year that we're currently in, obviously that hasn't been... Ah resolved yet that's, that's, that's why I was asking for yeah. Um, yeah. clarification yeah. if you're talking about 2017-18 um, the cap was 196.16 um, and the actual scheme payments were 194.8 but if it helps the committee um, we can send details of, yeah. of the past you know several years well uh, in terms of cap and in terms of payments but in, in just trying to consider no I, I accept that the government and the bus companies have come to a shared view of what the cap should be, so that, that tells us quite a lot. But is there an expectation that the current year's cap will be reached? I think, yes, it's fair to say, and we've communicated very openly with uh, the Confederation for Passenger Transport and individual bus operators. There is the expectation that the cap will be reached uh, in this year. Uh, and we've taken uh, actions accordingly. And, and finally, the <coughs> um, that does that uh, reflect an increased number of journeys that are being made using the, the scheme or, 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 or other factors? Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say there are a range of factors that influence things. Um, what I would say is uh, when we look at the year uh, going past, one of the things is we had quite a, a clement summer and winter. Um, which has had an influence on journey numbers and therefore on uh, on expenditure on the scheme. So, again, we've we've had open dialogue with the industry on this aspect, um, looking back at how we forecasted and on what has actually come to pass, um, and we're as open as possible on that. Thank you, convener. Jamie Green. Thank you, convener. Um, can I just uh, ask some questions around what is being reported in the media today, which? Uh, you can maybe clarify as accurate or in inaccurate information. 
and if it is accurate, it is of concern to me. Um, we're hearing reports that operators are being told that what will be available to them in the last four weeks of the uh, current financial year, the uh, reimbursement rate has been cut substantially uh, to them because uh, the budget is close to be, being used up, as Mr Grant confirmed. Um, can you give me some numbers around this? Uh, how, how much do you think uh, we are close to the budget being used up? Uh, what reduced grants are being offered to bus operators? And the reason I mention it is because we're getting feedback from some of the large operators, including uh, McGill's in my region, who say they simply uh, don't have uh, the revenue to deliver uh, any potential reductions uh, in subsidy and are looking to make uh, savings which could include uh, fare reviews and cutting services. Is that true? And what McGill's are looking to do? You need to ask them. If it is true, is it not of great concern to you? Um, uh, uh, it would always be a concern if they were looking to reduce services, but you'd have to ask them if that's what they're intending to do. So they haven't approached you with any concerns over this? No, no operator has expressed concerns over reaching the cap early? I, I haven't received any, uh, any correspondence from the girls have they, yeah. uh, that I'm aware of as yet. It may be in the system uh, if they've written to me about it, but I, I haven't as yet. Um, uh, uh, received a letter from okay, them. So why, why does the policy document that comes with this today say that the cap is not welcomed by the bus industry? Yeah, I think from the very outset they have never accepted the idea of a cap uh, on the concession affairs scheme, uh, which has been in exist it's been in place since it was established. Uh, or was it since it's been established? I believe so, yeah. So um, so they they've never accepted the idea of there being a cap. So which is put there to protect taxpayer. Sure, I understand the, the, the protecting the taxpayer. However, if we are reaching the cap and if we are running out of budget before the end of the financial year, then surely next year's budget would need to reflect that because what that obviously means is that bus operators throughout the country will not be receiving any subsidy or a reduced subsidy in grant on providing services for that end part of the financial year. Surely that would have an effect on what so, you foresee would be required next year. So going back to the point is that there are, uh, the figures for the year ahead are forecasts. So in the economic model, which was agreed with the industry, is to try to help to give us as accurate a picture around that as possible. Uh, uh, there will be variances from one year to the next. So you have... You know, if you look over the course of the last 10 years, I think there have been a couple of occasions when the, the, uh, uh, when the, the cap may have been reached, um, from what I can see here, and there's other years where the cap has not been reached. It, there are, it's a forecasting exercise going into the next year. Uh, and uh, we have amended the model uh, in the last couple of years to try and take account of some of the changes that are taking place. So... And we'll continue to work with the industry on how we can improve that model um, going forward. But it is a, it is a forecasting exercise uh, uh, to establish the cap. And it's a, but the mechanism for doing that was one which was agreed with the industry. Although I recognise the fact that from the very outset, the industry have never accepted the idea of a cap. Colin. Thanks, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you said that the order covers um, the extension of the scheme to um, carers with, with, with disabled um, children. Um, is, uh, cause, cause I'm, a bit, I'm a bit confused by that because I keep reading what I've read so far and I can't, I can't see what it actually says that. Um, so do, does, it, does it cover carers with um, disabled children? And if so, how much of the £213.65 million is to cover that? I was incorrect. It doesn't include that because that hasn't been rolled into the scheme yet. Okay. So, so what is the target date to extend eligibility? To um, uh, we are looking to undertake that work in the course of this coming year of the scheme. Uh, and I would hope we'd be in a position to see it introduced into the scheme in the following year. And so not until the following year? Okay. Yeah. And in terms of the rollout to modern apprentices, the government have indicated you support that in principle, but when is that going to happen? Uh, there's a bit of work we have to do around that to understand some of the details and the figures around it uh, as well. And I would hope that would be undertaken over the course of this year's programme as well. Uh, and therefore the view would be to introduce it to modern apprentices the next financial year as well? If we choose to do that, yes. 
Okay, thank you. Maureen, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, in the past, we've had constituents contact us to say um, that they were going from A to B, but their ticket showed that they were being charged from A to C or D or E. Um, how far have we managed to um, curtail that practice from the bus operators? So I'll get, um, I think John's probably in a better place to tell you about some of the uh, anti-fraud work that's undertaken um, around these things, because I've had it from constituents as well. Um, and there's a range of work that's undertaken as part of the, the Transport Scotland's fraud strategy uh, to deal with these issues and to engage directly with operators uh, on these matters. Do you want to mention a wee bit about the work we do in that area? Yeah, we do. I mean, we have a, a fraud strategy at the moment, which, which is being refreshed um, with different measures um, that we can take with the bus operators. We have a fraud and analysis team um, that look into constituents' um, complaints. And whilst there, there may be some journeys that are overstaged, a lot of, a lot of it, in some cases, is, is confusion um, from cardholders because with some bus operators, they don't, customers don't understand the fair stages. Um, and if a customer maybe says, I'm going to ASDA, they might expect the ticket to say ASDA, but the ticket would actually look, cover the next fair stage because it's, it's in look, fair bands. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly any, any inquiries that we get from, from card holders, um, we always look into, we respond to them. Um, we have mystery shoppers um, that go on the buses um, and do um, various exercises on different routes that constituents have highlighted. Um, and just this week, so the last week, um, because we had received a, a, a few inquiries about First Glasgow, um, colleagues of mine went to meet First Glasgow, um, and I think a lot of it was because First Glasgow have recently changed their fare structure, um, and for a lot of the services, they've, they've just looked two fares. So similar like cart holders thinking they're being overstaged, when, when they actually look at the analysis, they're not really. It's just the way First Glasgow record the journeys. Um, and I, we've engaged with um, First Glasgow's um, communications team who are actually going to refresh the driver training and hopefully provide additional information to card holders, whether it's posters on the bus or through social media. But certainly in the meantime, when we receive any inquiries, we always investigate it. We also have a free phone um, phone line that, that card holders can phone if they have any queries or if they want to re report any instance where they think that they're being overstaged. So is it reducing, increasing or staying the same? And Cabinet Secretary, would you still encourage our constituents to um, get in touch with us if they um, have reason to believe or would like to query it? Absolutely. So anyone who's got concerns, there's a process there for them to, to raise those concerns with us. Uh, and they will be investigated. So where there is a pattern of concerns being raised, uh, very often the approach that we will take is to, um, uh, is to use the different mechanisms that we have to actually uh, to check how that operator uh, is behaving, uh, or whether it's on a particular route or whether it's an operator as a whole, um, uh, to assess that. And if necessary, uh, and we believe it's appropriate, they'll be reported to the Procurator Fiscal. We believe that criminal activity, fraud has taken place, and that has happened in the past, and there have been successful prosecutions on that basis as well. Okay. Does any other member of the committee have a question? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I've been asked to... Uh, raise a question by a lady who's got a long-term disability who is entitled to a concessionary travel pass. She is concerned that every two to three years she has to go to a library to prove her disability. And she has recently received correspondence, sorry, she has received correspondence in the past which states that her disability entitlement needs to be reviewed because circumstances can improve. However, in her case, she has a long-term disability which will not improve. Um, and therefore would like long-term conditions to be recognised so that she doesn't have to keep proving her disability. Is this something that you would be able to look at uh, for the future so that this situation can be resolved? Yeah. More than happy if you want to pass on the details of the matter, more than happy for us to look into the matter. Okay, well, I'll ask the clerks to, to pass that on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to make any closing remarks? No. Thank you very much. Uh, therefore, we'll move on to agenda item three, which is the formal consideration of motion 
S5 M15754 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, calling on the Committee to recommend that the Bus Travel Concession Scheme for Older and Disabled Persons Scotland Amendment Order 2019 be approved. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity to move the motion. Moved. Do you have any further comments that you no wish comment. to make? No. Are there any comments that the members would Richard. wish to make? Richard. Again, I, I think that's uh, option two, I believe. Um, so, again, I, I believe this is good news, uh, but as usual, certain parties in this place was, wish to debase what is being done, a system which costs senior citizens nothing. But we've got to remember, senior citizens previously were taxpayers, so they're entitled to this uh, um, service. But it costs, and I have to remind people, this costs the government over £200 million. And I think it's a system, and I, I support the, the motion. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments from members? The question, therefore, is that motion S5M15754 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed, and that concludes our consideration of Agenda Item 3. I'd li now like to move the committee uh, into private session. Therefore, I close this part of the meeting. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary.